right, welcome to the Jeff Lerner Show or my YouTube channel, wherever you're seeing this or hearing this. Uh, so glad you're here. And today I am joined in the virtual studio, which basically means we both have internet and we're somewhere on earth. Um, <laughs> joined in the virtual studio with a good friend of mine, uh, Cameron George, who we're going to hear from. And, you know, if you watched a lot of my stuff, you know that I'm a, a big fan of a business model called affiliate marketing. Um, at where, and, and actually, I've, I, as I interview people, I, I always end up asking the question of most of them uh, where, where they would start or where they would have people start. And the most consistent answer from, from a wide variety of people has been affiliate marketing in terms of you know, modern entrepreneurship or digital marketing or acquiring the skills or you know, kind of just getting off the ground without overextending or overinvesting. Affiliate marketing is this kind of generally understood path of lessened resistance to getting a handle on being an entrepreneur in the world we live in. And Cameron is uh, among many great talents and skills uh, that I suspect we'll get into to many aspects of. Uh, one of the things he's well known for is as uh, the, the leader, one of the primary educators of one of the biggest affiliate marketing education platforms uh, on the internet. Um, so I suspect he'll agree with, with us that affiliate marketing is a great place for a lot of people to start <laughs> and we'll give him an opportunity to espouse that and even talk about how you can, can work with him if you so choose. But uh, long story short, Cameron's just a, a great friend and uh, somebody that I have conversations with periodically that uh, have no really obvious or express business purpose. They're just true two-person masterminds that I get so much value from because he's just a smart ass guy. And I, I'm saying he's a smart guy, not he's a smart ass. Um, so that said, that was a really long winded way of bringing you out. Cameron, welcome to the show, my man. Dude, it's great to be here. It's always good to hang out and have a chance to connect. Uh, I think this is the first time we've ever recorded anything. And maybe it's about time. <laughs> yeah, it's, maybe it is about time, although that may be for the best. We've gotten into some pretty whacked out stuff in some of our conversations. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad we're, we're doing it this way. Um, I love this format of getting to interview people. And, and even the term interview is kind of stuffy, maybe. It's really just converse with people. Um, but in a way where you know people are watching, you know other people are going to listen. So it kind of elevates the standard of like, what are we going to talk about and, and how much value are we going to try to pack into it? But it really gives me an opportunity to, to go back to relationships in some cases of people I've known for a long time and like ask them all the stuff that I've never asked them before. Um, you know, I can, I can pry a little bit and it's like, oh, well, it's for the people. So let me ask these questions that I never got around to asking you in the past. And you can't complain about it because it's for them. It's not for me. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so that's kind of how I'd like to approach this. You know, even before we just hit record, um, you and I were talking about, you know, the, the tendency of people to see a finished product. Um, to see, you know, in, in your case, let's say one of the, the, the systems that you've built or one of the platforms that you've created or one of the you know, pieces of software that you've designed um, or, and to just sort of think like, oh, that seems so far out there. That seems so high up the mountain. Like I, I couldn't do that. And, and you're saying, no, you know, very often what you're missing is all of the messiness and stress and time and you know, dead ends and just stuff that went into getting there that actually really humanizes it and makes you realize that, you know, Cameron's, Cameron's just a dude. He's just a normal person, right? He just puts his mind to things and like really works hard at them and eventually gets to this point where it, it seems so far out there and it seems so elevated and refined. But the reality, I think you use the analogy of like sausage, like so you know the sausage, sausage is made. Once you know how the sausage is made, you like you you're not so enamored with sausage, basically. So I would like to hear from you because I've known you a long time. I mean, was it like ten years now? Eight years? Ten years? Something? No, oh, yeah, Going back to the pro ten, just over ten years. I've been full time online ten years now. Yeah, so I would like you to take us back to to when the sausage was still like a pig on a farm, and like. <laughs> How, cause, cause I've known you long enough to go, man, Cameron, he pulls off some really cool stuff, but who was Cameron before he was pulling off this cool stuff? And, and how did Cameron get whatever the je ne sais quoi intangibles are? How did Cameron 
get to be the guy that does the cool shit that Cameron does. Because that's what I think everybody can really learn the most from, right? Because there was a time when Cameron wasn't Cameron. He was just Cameron. It's true. Guy, but it's it's right? the part that gets skipped over the most, in all honesty, every time. Um, because you do, you, you, you skip past it and people are want to talk about the things that are being done now or the things that are being done next. And in the kind of, I don't know, it's like social media these days, it's kind of breeding this culture of like narcissism, which I'm just not a huge fan of. And I just, I, I love when people are like, they are, they're showing and they're talking about how the sausage is made. Because I think when people, they see that, like there's no, there's no surprise. Like if you look at something like a, a giant building, some crazy monument that was built, it's like, you can't comprehend. You're like, how was that ever done? How was that possible? I can never imagine doing something that big or that crazy. It's so far away outside of my reality. I can't comprehend it. But it's like, you also realize that it's, it started with an idea. <laughs> it started with a thought. It started with a plan. There were some realizations, there were some influences into how that was done. And it's like building, it was an analogy. I'm sure you've heard this. You've heard that video or that clip. It was from Will Smith, I believe, actually. And about like a story that his grandfather used to tell him. And it was like about building a wall. And he's like, you don't, you don't build, a, you don't just build the whole wall. It's like you lay every brick as perfectly as any brick could be laid. And before you know it, it's been, it's done. And it's just like the people that are willing to talk about that. Um, there's so few and far between these days. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to think. Like yeah. That everyone wants everybody to think that they're like super special. But it's like when you realize how the sausage was made, how somebody got from A to B and what it really took to create and accomplish what they have, that there's really nothing special about them at all. And that anybody that had cultivated the same beliefs and taken the same actions could actually do the exact same thing as well. And that there really is no difference between you or anybody else around you outside of like that story that you're kind of telling yourself. So. Yeah. You talk about uh, social media and you use that term narcissism. It's, it's interesting. I, I, I agree very much. I think with, with what you're saying um, th that it's like this, it's almost like a, a, a narcissism that's, you know, narcissism is an actual like psychological pathological condition that like individuals have, but it's almost like a collective narcissism with social media where it's not each individual participant. It's, it's us as like a group think body who've sort of decided to all buy into this idea of instant gratification and immediate turns and a polished filtered existence that cuts out all the messy details. And I think that it, what started as a collective has unfortunately infected us as individuals or, or I don't know if it started that way, but I mean, I guess everything's an outgrowth of individuals, but like, you know what I mean? It's like, we kind of all bought into this facade or this idea because it made for a lot of pretty pictures, but it's actually started to like set in in a really damaging way where like people don't want to do the work because it doesn't look as pretty as the picture, you know? And they don't and, realize and that the work is the only way to get the picture. It's the only way. Yeah. You want the body, but you don't want to be at the gym at 7 a.m. You want the body, but I want that extra helping and serving more. Yeah. And it's like the person he's like, says, you know, I'm 18 years old and I have no money and I don't know what to do. And I have a dream and I want this and I want that. I want that. And I, you know, I get these messages and, and a lot of times my answer, and I actually try to be, I try to be both supportive and encouraging, but also like painfully honest. And sometimes my answer is like, go after it and your life's probably going to suck for 10 to 20 years. And like, that's not that popular of an answer anymore, but it's like, that was me. I was 16 or 17. I dropped out of high school at 17. I had a dream and my life was so hard for 12 years. I was 29 is when I actually started getting somewhere. Um, and, and, and for you, you said you've been online for how long? 11? Full time online for 10 years. 10 years. Okay. So over like 10 years. So January 16th, 2010 was the day that I, quit. I used to be an electrical apprentice. I was a third year. Electrical okay. Apprentice. Yeah. Talk. I want to talk. I want to hear about Cameron, the electrical apprentice. Cameron, the electrical apprentice. Cameron, the electrical apprentice was a completely different person. Partied on the weekends. I, I literally, so um, I have one really good friend of mine that I went back and he was like my first student that I like ever taught this to. Because after I did go out and I accomplished some pretty great things, I, I built my first 
um, million dollar business. And honestly, I was like, I was really lonely. And I went back and I taught this. I went back and it was like, I need to have like, I need some friends <laughs> that can travel <laughs> to the lifestyle and do the things that I'm going to do and think right. the way that I think and um, that are entrepreneurial, that are into what I'm into. And there was actually one friend of mine that was from that era. And um, he's seen the whole thing. He watched the whole transition. He was laughing. He's like, dude, you're not even the same person anymore, um, which I'm ta I take as a compliment. Um, but like when I was an electrician, like I, uh, I actually used to play competitive paintball, like professionally. Huh, so okay. at one point before I did all of this, like I was, I turned down like very good electrical jobs up North in the oil field to make less money so that I could have a better quality of life. Um, where I was living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And, um, two weeks out of every month, I would be flying around on the team owner's um, private jet. He owned like uh, he owned about nine or 10 different car dealerships in Edmonton and he was an owner and he would take us around. We'd fly around on his private jet to the um, NXL and we'd go play in the NXL or the MPPL at the time. And I played professional paintball two weeks out of every month where it was like this free paid vacation and it was a great yeah. time. And then I partied on the weekends and I worked as an electrical apprentice um, the other two weeks out of the, out of the month. And uh, in 2008, 2009, there was the whole like Dodge Chrysler fiasco. The economy was crashing and mm -hmm. um, he realized like he's not going to be able to pay us anymore. Uh, be, it'll be a free vacation. But here I was 19 years old. Um, I bought my first home when I was 19 years old in Canada. And I was like, well, I can't take two weeks off every month and pay my mortgage. Like, right, right. I can't do that. So then here I find myself from like living my dream life um, as a kid where it's like, I mean, I don't know if anybody's played or seen competitive paintball with all the, like the things blown up and you're, it's like a hockey game, five on five, two 20 minute halves. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. I loved it. It was like, it literally was like living a video game. Um, I loved it. The 10 year old me couldn't have been happier. But when I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do that, like as a career, there really was no career in that. There was nobody really mm -hmm. making insane amounts of money or having any sort of lifestyle. And it was the team owner dropping me off one day. I remember he made a comment and he meant it as a compliment. He told me that my home was cute. And I was like, I was so offended. <laughs> so I was like, cute. Like, I'm the only person under the age of 45 that owns a house in this neighborhood. Like I'm going to right. be paying this off for the rest of my life. Like I couldn't comprehend that there could have been something better or something else. And it was ever since he made that, made that comment, it got me thinking like, how am I flying around on your private jet? What is it that you know? How do you own all of these businesses and car dealerships and stuff? And he mm -hmm. kind of like, that was the first time that like I had this entrepreneurial seed planted for me where I realized I'm like all the things that I've been taught growing up, have been, are completely different than what you think or what you teach your sons. And I can remember that night, I even started thinking back that night to as like we just landed, it was, it was like one or two o'clock in the morning, we landed on his private jet and he was driving me um, and his two, his two sons were in the car and he was driving me home to drop me off. And as we were driving home, there was um, construction everywhere on the roads. And most people in the summer in Edmonton, like there's road construction everywhere. And most people are annoyed by it. They're complaining about it. They're like, ah, oh, frigging construction again, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, here he is, and I've never heard this narrative before. He's talking to his sons about how great this is, how great it is for Edmonton and the community and the jobs that it's creating. And I was just like, I was dumbfounded by like just this different perspective about what he believed, what he thought, what was different. So ever since like that moment where I was like genuinely offended, like, wait a second, how, how could I live and, and have a different life and do something differently? Um, I always, st I started asking him questions anytime I could. And it was like the very, like I said, it was the first time that like somebody planted that like entrepreneurial seed for me. And there was a comment that he made one time. Um, cause like now all of a sudden, like we're at practice, we're doing stuff. And I'm just like, I'm literally just around him all the time asking him questions. Um, and I can remember one time he was like, Cameron, he's like, honestly, even if you made less money in your electrical apprenticeship, even if you made less money, but you did it working for yourself because of the tax benefits, you'd still be way better off financially and be making more money. I'm like, whoa, like, what do you even mean by that? And um, it was that little seed that he kind of planted for me that uh, kind of really started to change the way that I thought about 
business, about money, about myself, about the world, about what was possible. And um, at this, up until this point in my life, all I was doing was like partying, playing video games, traveling the world and playing paintball and showing up to my electrical job when I needed to. But when that got taken away from me, the paintball side of things, all of a sudden I found myself working 40, 60 hours a week in this electrical job. And I started to realize I was like, this is my future. And it like, it really started to scare me because I started to look around at like the people that I was surrounded by. And I just like, there was just a part of me that realized like this, this can't be it. <laughs> like this like, can't be it. I started like, I caught myself saying like little mantras and stuff in the morning where it was like 40 more years. And I realized like I was legitimately counting down the time. Like I was like, it was like, I was putting it, putting in to like get through the day and get over with it. And like, I was, I was going to miss my, my life. And I had this, like, there was this one moment and I've told this story a lot to different um, clients and stuff. And it was, I don't know if you've ever heard this one before, but I, I can remember getting up before work one day and I was in the shower and I, I had this, like, I just had that like realization that um, if I didn't change where I was going, that I was actually going to end up where I was headed. And what I realized where I was headed was like the journeyman that I was learning from at the time I mean, the dude was an alcoholic. He had a failed marriage. His daughter wouldn't talk to him. He was in debt. And it was just like, I'm just spending all day listening to this guy on this construction site complain. And I realized I'm like, that's like, that's going to be me. Like, that's where I'm going. Like I'm showing up, I'm working with him every day. Like these are the, these are the, the key influences in my, in my life. And, um, I like, I had an honest to God, like panic attack in the shower. Like I freaked out. Like, I, I don't know if anyone's like, you've ever had a panic attack, dude. It was not, it was not fun. And like, I tripped out a little bit. And, um, that was the day that I decided to like, that I wanted to be in business for myself. Like that was like the first like entrepreneurial spark and realization first and foremost, like to me, I believe like that first like big realization for me was like, I want to be in control of my life. And I don't like the way things are going and I want something different. I don't know what that is yet. And that was like one of that, those like first big realizations. It's like, I realized that like I had that like heart and desire to want to do something different. You know, it, first of all, thanks for telling me that story, dude. I'm like, I've never been so glad I asked a question in my life. <laughs> I, it's a beautiful story. And I feel like I know you so much better, literally just from hearing it. I feel I totally connect and resonate and it it's so interesting. I have so many, so many thoughts. So, you know, I talk to a lot of people, same with you over the course of our career, we've, we've been an, an agent of change in a lot of people's lives. Like we have a lot of sort of inception conversations with people. Like, what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? Why are you trying to accomplish it? We have, we have a lot of what I would call like incipient startup conversations with people, people that are, either on the verge of making a change or they've just decided to make a change and we're kind of like having that guidance conversation. We also occasionally get to have conversations like this with people that are 10 years on the other side of those decisions and have come out with really fantastic stories. And so we, we have a basis for comparison to say, okay, I've had, I've had hundreds or maybe even thousands of like day one conversations with people, especially you and I used to be uh, affiliates in a, in a marketing programs where we were literally getting on the phone with people like, Hey, do you want to do this? Here's what it is, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to have conversations like this. We're like, okay, what is not only what happened 10 years later, but also who is it that actually got there 10 years later, as opposed to all the people that never made it and they, they failed or they, they dropped out or they quit or whatever. Right. I can tell you the difference based on my experience. The juxtaposition is on day one, you hear a lot of conversations about people deciding to try something. But when I hear you talk, you're not telling me that you had this panic attack and decided that you were going to try a thing. You had a panic attack and decided that you were going to do a thing. Like it, I'm not hearing you say like, well, yeah, I, I realized that I needed to fire up this little, this little side project for my electrician job. And, you know, over here, I dabble a little in this thing and try to nurture it. You know, you were like, no, I don't want this life. My, my soul is dying anyways. So I don't really care if my body goes with it because I'm not doing it. I'm going over here and I'm doing this. And it was, it sounds, you know, I'm hearing you tell a story of a big shift, a big decision, a big, an embracing of a new thing and a severing of an old thing, not a story of like, 
yeah, I think I want to try this thing. Would you, would you agree? Is that consistent with your experience that like, that's at least one of the big differentiators between the minority of success stories and the majority of failure stories, which is not. Oh, absolutely. There's a big difference because like what I did is in that moment, I made a commitment to like the how didn't matter. Mm. I was going to the other side regardless. And, and, and let me prove my point with this. Um, that day I came home and you want to know what I decided to start? Cause I started where I was like, you don't have to see the entire staircase before you can take the first step. I came home that day and you want to know what I was going to do? I was starting a cleaning company. So the first few million dollars that I did in sales was put through a company called made to clean. Like literally my company name was a click. I was in the process of setting up this cleaning company. Cause in my head only thought I, I, I was raised and like my dad was an electrician. That's how I ended up being there as well. I, I, I mean, he was such a hard, like I appreciate everything that he did and the life that he provided for me. And, but I could only, I couldn't get my head around anything other than dollars for hours. Yeah. So I had all these friends that wanted additional work that were like, yo, we, if we could do cleaning company, I was like, well, if I could get clients for cleaning, then I mean, I could bill at 25. You only want 15. Okay. I can make an extra $10 an hour, not doing like, that's where my head was at. So I just started right. with what I could to do something. I was like, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to start this. Like, I, I didn't know what to do. I just knew that like, I was going to make a change. And instead of coming home and getting baked with my buddies and playing video games, I came home and I started to like, I started to change my life. I started to read books. I started to, but like it all started with, I came home that night. And as I was setting up the cleaning company and going through the process, like sending in the registration forms was when I clicked on my first ad. Mm. And it was like was on it? clicking on that ad, it led me to filling out a program, filling in, buying this, uh, buying this information package for this company. And in going through that information package, it was selling and it was talking about the, uh, it was talking about all of the opportunity in the health and wellness space and like how it was this multi-billion dollar industry and it was growing. And the crazy thing is like how big it is now compared to what it was there. Like it was, that was right. legitimate information, but it was really epiphanizing me and it ended up selling me on a direct sales company, but the direct sales company what blew my mind. I couldn't sleep for days because of this realization. When I realized that I could sell another company's products without having inventory, mm without holding space, without having employees, the very fact that I could go make a sale and that company would ship the product or deliver and fulfill the product on their end and that I could be paid for it. Like I literally didn't sleep for days. Hmm. Like it, like it, it was so, it was such a radical thought and concept to me. And now like we talk about it, like it's no big thing, but like I literally didn't sleep for days realizing that like basically that affiliate marketing existed. It's like, right, so right, you're right. telling me this, con like, wait, why are they willing to pay me to do that? And it's like, that, like, that was like my, that was my first rabbit hole in that thought. But like the modality and the how changed from like, I'm setting up a cleaning company to eventually, I mean, I ended up finding myself like almost $60,000 into debt from buying courses and eBooks and chasing things around, trying to put it together before I took a step back. And I realized like, how have I really been successful in anything else that I've done in life? And it was really about like modeling like how I became yeah. a professional paintball player was I went and I tried, there was a guy who was the best paintball player in Canada and he was having tryouts for a, a, an amateur team that he was, that he was running. And I went and I tried, I made it for that. I ended up living and training and going on. Like, he's like, he's basically my big brother. Like we're family now, but it was like, I started to, to think and realize like, what did I do to accomplish success in other areas of my life? Cause I had this identity level belief. I still do that. Like, and I, I kind of see this in like most people and pretty much all successful people that go on to accomplish things is they almost have this like delusional confidence. Yeah. And like, I, I've heard oh, totally. Will Smith again, talk, talk about this. He's like, I believe I could, if I wanted to, I could go be the president of the United States. And it's like, I genuinely believe that like, if somebody else can do something, I don't care if it's only one person, if it has been done that I can do it too. It just means that there's a way. And it also means that they know the way. And I'm like, I don't care if nobody else can do it. I can do it because somebody else has done it and improved it. And that's why like the second, like that first stone might've been like having the heart and desire to change. If, you're, if I was building a wall, the second stone was like starting to actually realize like what was possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's so cool to hear you talk. I, I'm here, you know, and, and it's so often in these conversations, I find these 
they, they feel almost eerie similarities or commonalities, but I, I actually don't think they're as eerie as maybe they feel because I think a lot of people have certain types of experiences. There's just some of us that are more affected by them than others. The reality is most people have probably been around other people that are at a dramatically different station than them, you know, in terms of, of success or abundance or happiness or whatever, right? It's just some of us are so impacted by that. Some of us are, are unaffected by it. Some of us are angered by it. Some of us are in denial about it. Like people have different responses to things. You had proximity to this guy and you, and you allowed those seeds to be planted, right? You were, your soil was at least fertile for what he was sharing. You know, when I was a piano player, you know, I was a musician in my 20s, I got invited uh, to play in the homes of what, at least half a dozen billionaires and, and several dozen, like 100 millionaires plus guys, like CEOs of, you know, I was in Houston, a big city, energy capital of the world, the CEOs of, of you know, companies like Enron and Halliburton and um, you know, some like the, the guys that own the Houston Astros and the Houston Rockets, I played piano in their houses and I was exposed to these billionaires. And, you know, I, a few of them I even got to talk to, but for the most part, it was just, it was just soaking it in. Like, what the hell is going on here? How are these people? And, you know, and then I'd, I'd be on break and I'd go in the back. They'd, they'd walk us out through the second, you know, those ha billionaires houses have like, hidden corridors and stuff where the service people operate. It's totally like Downton Abbey. So I'm like in the hidden corridors with the musicians and the caterers and the bar staff and whatever. And they're all grumbling and they're, they can't wait to get outside to smoke their cigarettes and they're all pissed at the world and they don't get paid enough and they all have problems and their baby daddy's mad at them and whatever. And I'm like, dude, I want to get back in the party. Those people are a lot more fun. Like they're, <laughs> They have smiles on their faces. They're dressed nice. They smell good. The food is good. They're dancing. And I just had this crazy juxtaposition that I allowed to really impact me. And it's like you say, once you see that it's possible, then you just kind of have to decide whether or not you're going to keep telling yourself that you aren't like those people that maybe they come from Mars and you come from Venus and you're not the same species and you can't do what they can do. Or you accept that actually we're all human and we can all kind of do the same things. And then once you accept that, it's pretty damn convicting if you sit on your ass and don't do it, you know? And you talk about delusional confidence, and I, I agree. It does feel like delusional confidence. I, I feel delusional in my confidence. I'll tell you a guy I look at a lot, and I'm like, look at what he's done. It's Grant Cardone. It's not that I want to be Grant Cardone. He and I have, I think, different personalities and different belief systems and different attitudes about a lot of things. But you look at what he's done in terms of harnessing social media and the current you know, technology and platforms in the market to create brand awareness and authority for himself. And, he, you know, there's probably no one that's done it bigger than him right now. And I'm like, shit, he's 64. I'm 40. Give me 24 years. Give me 20. In fact, give me 23 years. I'll do him right? one better. You know, it's, like it becomes like not a matter of if it's just a matter of when it's like, it's um, doable. I, got, I have time on my side. It's not, it's not and just doable. I, it's inevitable. And if I land at half or I land at double, it really doesn't matter. The point is just that the, the expansion of thought creates possibilities that like you say seem delusional to most people because most people really seem dug in on the belief that there is something fundamentally different between them and the people that are really out there doing it and i just don't see it that way and i know you don't either that, yeah I mean, not, not at all not even a little bit i just i believe that it, it can be done and that's like what really so <clears throat> there's just so many parts of my story i've never told before like i come out of um putting myself like this far in debt before i find um, one of our mutual friends actually. And, uh, I started to really realize like, oh, this is somebody that can really like, this is somebody who's running a multi-million dollar business, um, on the internet for them. And it's like, when that like sunk in for me, that that was possible. And I started to realize like, oh my God, like I could, and I got hung up on the number of making, of earning like hundred thousand dollars a month, because like, that was like, that was my dad's annual salary that our entire right. family lived off of that I'm like, I could make monthly because of a skill set and thing that I could learn and do for myself. And I became like, so elated. Like I was like, 
I was delusional. I'm telling my parents we make a hundred thousand. I'm like, who am I to say that? I'm a freaking struggling construction worker making like 20 some dollars an hour living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, who used to play paintball and party on the weekends. And I sounded like a lunatic. <laughs> like I genuinely sounded like a lunatic and I'm telling my dad this stuff. And he's like, Cameron, just take they, like, like at this point, they literally had to come out. They had like an honest to God intervention with me. And they're trying to tell me like, That's so they just watched me put myself like at this point, I'm like $60,000 in debt. I'm doing this thing on the internet. They can't understand. And I can't, I can't explain. But what I was really doing is I had this entrep. I, I wanted to go build a business. I had this entrepreneurial drive and I seen that learning the skills of digital sales and marketing could be applicable in any way. It didn't matter the business on the planet. It doesn't matter how good your product is. If you stack it down on the corner, it's not going to sell itself. You have to be able to create awareness. And I really see where the trends were going. And I mean, just this last year, like digital advertising surpassed traditional print for the first time in history. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, and I seen that back in 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008, where things were going. And, um, I can remember sitting down there with my parents when they're like trying to tell me like, I'm crazy. I'm friggin' lunatic. I was being a lunatic. Like, let's be real. Um, <laughs> who, who walks around and tells you? me we're going to make a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, but internet. how old were you? 22. Yeah. So mo I mean, what are most 22 year olds doing? Like, Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the next, you know, Rolling Stones in my rock band or yo, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move to LA and be an actor or like, I mean, everybody's nuts when they're 22. It's true. At I was just, I, I, I sounded delusional. Production. Yeah. But what I was trying to tell them was that like, this was my business school. Um, but to them, like they thought I just like got scammed by some Nigerian prince on the internet. Like they didn't know right. what was going on. They just seen that like you have all this debt and you're pretty erratic. Like, like are you okay? Like they literally flew from a province over to come in and like sit me down. And I was trying to explain to them. I was like, one of my friends there was in business school and I'm like, how is this any different? Except that like I get to learn from somebody who's actually running like all this money that you've watched me spend, I've spent it to hire a mentor who's actively running the type of business that I'm interested in learning about. Like I actually want to, I'm like, think of it an internship or an mm -hmm. apprenticeship. But when it comes to digital sales, marketing and, and, and online business, I'm like, I'm like, why do I want to go pay to have a four year degree from somebody that's sitting in the front of the classroom that makes $30,000, $40,000 a year and isn't in business for themselves. I'm like, this is, I'm like, as crazy as this might seem to you, like, this is me going out and like finding and personally hiring my own professor. <laughs> I just, while you're talking, I just did a search online of average college professor salaries in, in the United States. So the average economics professor in the United States makes $107 a year, US. It's a little under 10 grand a month. Studying money and production and teaching it at the highest level, they make $117,000 a month, or, or a year, sorry. Now, that's decent money. I'm like, I'm not poo-pooing that, but you and I both know that by applying ourselves, uh, we'll use just you and me as a sample group, uh, by applying ourselves to learning skills that are far less complex than the amount of learning required to get a PhD in economics. We've both been able to make that much and then some and then many and much more than some of that much in a month, much less a year. And that's the guy teaching it in the college who everybody else is going a hundred or 200 or $300,000 in debt to learn from. And you spent 60 grand to learn from a guy that was making that much every month, which you've now gone on to do. And yet people said you were crazy. Right. Yeah. That's pretty much what happened. But isn't it, I mean, <clears throat> it's just funny because these are kind of some of the social conditionings as well. And like, I can remember being a kid, I was 10 years old. I was in Prince George and there was a skate shop called ruins board shop in Prince George. I used to always go there. It's where I buy my shoes, my skate shoes and my, my new boards and stuff. And I remember being there and I'm 10 years old and I asked the guy, um, cause we were just hanging out at the skate shop all day, waiting for my friend's mom to come pick us up. And I asked him how much he made. I've never been like verbally destroyed by somebody so much uh, in my life. Like 
You don't ask like, that. like yeah. tearing into me. I'm a 10 year old kid. I was like, I just wanted to know, cause I thought this would be great. Like maybe I'm going to work at a skate shop for the rest right. of my life. Like, is it possible to live up? And I asked that, but our cultural conditioning is never to talk about money or anything. Meanwhile, it is the number one thing, whether people realize it or not, that they spend the, like the majority of their time after in order to, I mean, quite honestly survive. And it was just like one of those things that I realized that, um, learning about like finances, business, how to be able to increase income was like that linchpin. Um, it was that main focal point that kind of unlocked freedom in all of the other areas of my life. But it's just funny because it's like we're having this conversation like it's nothing, which I just, I love. Um, and this is what all of my conversations, all of, I know your conversations are like behind, like this is what we always talk about, but it's just funny that like, um, I meet and I sit down with some of my old high school friends and stuff like that. And I love them for so many other reasons, but like technically the conversation we're having right now is almost, it's taboo. Yeah. Oh, I know. To, you're not it, supposed it, to talk about money. No, you're not supposed, <laughs> you're not to, supposed talk to talk about, about religion or you're not supposed to talk about politics. Yeah. And what's interesting is here's the thing. I get why you, why we don't talk as much about religion and politics because people have, people have very strongly opposed or dis different experiences of things that cause them to have different beliefs about things. The thing I don't get though, is how people can have that type of differentiation around money. Money's a pretty universal thing. Like I get how you can have different opinions about abortion. I get how you can have different opinions about gun control. But how can you have a different opinion about money? Or math. It's like or having a different opinion math. about yes. math. Like one plus one does equal two. Like this yeah, is and, irrefutable. And, and $3 <laughs> does equal a gallon of milk. And $300,000 does equal a Bugatti. And like, you know, $22,000 a month does equal like mortgage plus taxes. I mean, how do people get so worked up about this stuff? I know, because of, because of insecurity, shame fear, embarrassment, you know. It was a big thing that I had to get over because of like, again, I realized that I had that conditioning that I never wanted to talk about it because of that moment when I was 10 years yeah. old and I got like, just, I've never been so embarrassed. You know what I mean? I went out, I couldn't even stay in the store anymore. I had to go outside, like we gotta leave. I'm not welcome yeah. here anymore. Cause I asked, <laughs> I asked. So how, are, how are young people supposed to, you know, and, and it's interesting. The majority of my customers are, like older because just older people have money, you know, to buy courses and training and stuff. I say older, I mean like out of college, they're not like living already living in debt. Um, but the majority of the people that message me and, and maybe this is just somewhat of the demographic of social media and direct messaging, but like I get so many messages from young people and it's, it's like to overwhelming. There's no way I can respond to all of them. And I, I really do try, but like what I realize is, there is exactly what you're saying, a pervasive, tragic, and almost like epi epidemiological, like, like a sickness around consciousness of what money really is, how it really functions, what's really possible, what's really out there. And people get angry. People just really like by default angry against money because dependency breeds hostility. We know that from psychology. When you're dependent on a thing, but you're constantly feeling starved of the thing, you start to resent the thing. And that's basically everybody's sort of default setting with money. And it's like, it's crippling and it's tragic. It's like we're all walking around with one hand tied behind our back. I believe that it's a problem that everybody has the ability to solve. They just lack the information on how to solve it. And that can be solved with like just proper financial literacy. Like to me, it's, a, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki's cash quadrant. Cash yeah, flow quadrants. Right. The employee, the self-employed, the um, business owner, and the investor. <clears throat> it's like to me the point to be in a business, to be in business, or to be self-employed. Because, like, in all honesty, back then, like, all I wanted to do, I didn't give a shit about having a huge impact, building a big right. business, innovating and creating, helping a million people. Like, all I wanted to do was to be able to work from home for myself so that I didn't have to go be surrounded by people that I didn't like and have to waste hours every day commuting back and forth and getting up at times and working hours that I wasn't comfortable with. All I wanted to do was to be able to work at home for myself. But the reality of the situation is that when you're in business for yourself or when you're self-employed, 
you get to define your income. It's like taking the ceiling off your income potential. And then when you have financial literacy tied into that and like what you're actually doing with your capital, how you're putting it to work inside of your business or inside of your life, um, that's where like real, I believe real freedom comes from. And I, I know that there's like some essence of like what everybody wants is a sense of freedom, but it's like in order to achieve true, un, like unfettered freedom, like in every area of your life is to achieve financial freedom, which is, like, I, which is why think, it's the big problem that everybody to needs that. to solve. I don't think you're supposed to say that because I think we've all been taught that we already live in free countries and we're all already free. But if so that were true, you could, could you technically free? spend a hundred percent of your time all day, every day doing whatever you wanted? Yeah, that, and, I, I agree. We're, we're, I mean, that's the, that's the, the fallacy is that even, even in our freedom, most of us are actually only free, like maybe what, 10% of our time. Yeah. But in order to have that, you have to achieve financial freedom. In order to achieve financial freedom, you have to achieve financial security first. In order to achieve financial security, you have to be able to achieve financial independence. In order so, to achieve financial independence means that you have to take responsibility for yourself and your finances. So let me say this. I am actually at, at, a, at a purely self-interested level. I am grateful that the world is as fucked up as it is because it means that I can decide to be an entrepreneurial evangelist, to share the good news of what's possible and to talk about money in a liberated way and to talk about life and freedom in a liberated way. And that people aren't all saying, Jeff, shut up. We've heard it all before. <laughs> because that's actually what would happen if this stuff was common knowledge and common, commonly taught. As it turns out, the world's uh, you know, screwed up in this creates my opportunity to do what I do. So at that level, I'm grateful for it. But it's still, it doesn't necessarily mean I understand it. So like, I'm curious your thoughts. And I don't, I don't necessarily probably typically go down these, these roads with most conversations because- I'm just the one that's picking up rabbit holes right away. Well, we get into woo-woo land when we start getting into like conspiracies and stuff. But like, seriously, dude, man to man, like I, I respect your, your brain so much. Why is the world like it is? Why aren't we teaching our kids we live in the 21st century with the freaking internet, man. Like it's not actually supposed to be that hard anymore. And we still are teaching our kids that it is. Why? I genuinely believe that it's, it's systemic. Like I don't believe that it's intentional. It's systemic. And it happens from um, almost this thought of, and it's what I talked about before, like responsibility. Um, just, just like, you know, when you're a kid, you think that like all the grownups got it figured out. And then you become a grownup and you're like, holy shit, nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like it's like that it's like you technically you look to a doctor and they're supposed to be in charge of your health it's like no like you're actually in charge of your health they're there to like troubleshoot if something goes wrong or right. you look at a bank and you think that like oh banking um 401ks and uh and mutual funds and all of these products it's literally a product of a bank is like that the bank and these financial managers have your best interests at heart. And it's like, until you, and you start, there's almost this like, there's this undertone of, and I know that this word will irk some people, um, a victim mentality, that it's not my fault, that I don't have to take responsibility for it. And the reality like, like is that the a, only like way that- a passenger, almost like we're all a passenger in these aspects of our lives. And it's true. And this can get woo-woo because you see it in all these different areas. And like, I'll, I'll go a little woo-woo in the sense of like epigenetics. So epigenetics is the science like above the gene, right? And that's where like all of a sudden like consciousness plays into it. So it's like, just like there's the placebo effect, there's the nocebo effect where like mind enters and actually has like as influenced double blind closed studies where it's like, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. And it's like where consciousness and stuff is coming into this, but it's like when you really think about it in that sense. So like, um, what was the guy's um, name? Bruce Lipton, who wrote the book, the biology of belief, mm -hmm. like 40 years ago, he was working with stem cells. You know what I mean? Like we think that that's like the most cutting edge information and stuff right now. And when he was working with these, when he was working with stem cells, what he realized, cause like he could take two stem cells that are genetically identical, genetically identical. And he could put them in two different environments. So two different chemical reactions and two different Petri dishes. And even though they were genetically identical, they would become completely different things. So one could become a bone cell. One could become a liver cell. 
And it's like, how is that possible if we, if like our undertone of genetics says that you are the way you are and there's nothing you can do about it? Mm -hmm. This is completely contradictory evidence right here. These two things are genetically identical. How are they different things? And the reality was that what he had realized and what he had proven in biology was that the environment was a completely dictator and, and defining factor of what something could become. So it's like you can take and you can extrapolate that like that's on the micro level, but on the macro level, like us as individuals, the environment that we're in, like the environment was on the job site, surrounded by people that were broken down, like you're, you're, you are the average of your five closest friends and influences, right? right. And while now, it's like you look at our circle of influence and it's like, I mean, do you have any close friends that you spend any serious amount of time with that doesn't run a wildly successful business to and like have these these same kind of traits of like how they take responsibility in all areas of life anymore no i i i mean truly i don't and it's interesting you say that because i deal a lot i i and sometimes i don't know how much of it i create and how much of it i actually is is really out there but i i feel um almost a little bit of a, of a friction or hostility with a lot of the world because I kind of, at risk of sounding haughty, I kind of have intentionally created a separation between myself and most of the world. And I feel like they kind of, they're like, they like resent it because like Jeff's so out there and gregarious on the internet and he's talking about these things and he like seems super approachable, but then actually in real life, like I'll help and I'll answer questions if asked, but like you said, I'm not going to spend, there's only 168 hours in a week. I mean, if I realistically had to carve up my time, I could budget maybe like two to four to spend with people that had negative energy before it actually started to harm me. And since so much of the world has kind of negative energy, I'm just like, eh, -eh. sorry. I'm but do you see that? The, do you see like just the undertone of what you said of like, how responsible you were with how you were spending or investing your time. Yeah, I, no, I, I, exactly. And, and I'm like, so yeah, in answer to your question, I think, I remember I had a piano professor, you know, I, I was really serious about music uh, in my late teens and early 20s. One of my first piano teachers that was really good, and it was a very attuned, sort of like high vibration person, in addition to being a really gifted musician, he said, Jeff, you've got a real talent for, for music but you have to protect it and protecting your talent basically means probably pulling back from 90% of the people in your life because he was saying actually something as seemingly innate, seemingly like genetic, like you're saying as musical ability is actually more like epigenetically suggestible and malleable based on simply the people around you. And that like actual artistic talent can be destroyed by being around consistently lesser talents. And that's, that gets into kind of like a supercilious thing to say, but like, if you're a really great musician, you should actually only hang out with really great musicians or you are actually lessening yourself as a musician. Yeah. And if you're a really great entrepreneur, you need to commit to being around really great entrepreneurs as much as possible. And if you're a really great, you know, philosopher, be around great philosophers. And if you're a great paintballer, be around great paintballers. And like what you say no to is what you say yes to and vice versa, you know, or they're, they're anyway. You, I, so yeah, same page, dude. Thank you. You've like reinforced in me this, this confidence that is part of, by the way, the delusional confidence, I think is to actually get to a point in your life. And this is, I'm saying this, I'm saying this to you, Cameron, but I'm saying this to, to a lot of people that are going to watch this, that part of this delusional confidence is getting to where you can tell people in your life who want you to need them that you don't. Have you ever had to do that? Yeah, I've had to set boundaries. It was really hard. But it, it, you do, you have to, the thing is like, I mean, it's, if, if an airplane's going down, whose mask are you supposed to put on first? Yeah. Like if you don't take the time and this is why like, I'm so passionate about like morning routines and rituals. Like I believe that first you create your habits, then they create you. And that uh, like, you have to take that, you have to 
fill your cup up. Otherwise you've got nothing to give, mm-hmm. right? Like you can't give from an empty cup. So I, I'd like to, uh, if you're okay with it, <clears throat> to talk a little more and, and, you know, feel free to draw a line if it gets personal or, you know, we don't want to like pretty much an open book, dude. I'm like, well, I, I know you are, but I still, gotta, <laughs> I still say that. Right. Like I'd like to hear, because again, you know, I, I try to be um, a mirror back to the world of like, I take the, the energy and the light that comes to me through a lot of questions and direct outreach. And I want to try to like project it back to the world with my added, you know, bit of light to the spectrum and just try to share and help. And what I hear so much is people that feel constrained, trapped, limited, suppressed, whatever, in the same way that you were talking about, where like it's people at their work or it's people in their family or it's you know, something in their sphere that like is like won't let them become who they're trying to become. And if you have a history with that, or if you have an experience with that, that you think might empower someone else to do maybe a hard thing in their life, I would love if you'd share it. It kind of comes down to like, honestly, like radical responsibility. Cause there are like, you end up with people in your life that want to like enforce and push themselves on you and take, but it's like, sometimes we're not even like aware of it. You know what I mean? We almost got to take a step back to realize like, parasitic relationships, (laughs) Mm -hmm. people that need you more than, um, than you need them. And I've, I've definitely, definitely, um, had those in my life. And it was, it was really hard, especially because when you, I mean, I'm the least confrontational person in the world. So I'm like, I'm the, I'm more likely, and this is sad because I'm aware of it. It's like, I'm more likely to go along with it than not rock the boat, even though knowing it's not in my best interest, mm-hmm. which is like, unfor- that's like literally saying like, I'm going, uh, I know that this is a bad investment of my right. time, of yeah, that's my a energy, very un- of that's everything, a very- but I'm going to continue to make it so that it doesn't upset anybody. <laughs> that's a very non-entrepreneurial admission of weakness right there. I mean, really. And, and, and honestly, it's one of my, it's one of the biggest things that like, that I struggle with because like, I genuinely don't like confrontation. And when you're in the business world, there's people who are sharks that they yeah. like to them, they have this mentality of win, lose in order for me to win, somebody else has to lose. And I want to take something from you. And, and honestly, unfortunately, it's kind of this undertone belief, whether people realize it or not, it's this paradigm that we have about the world. And I mean, it's just, I mean, you watch a sporting event in order for somebody to win the Super Bowl, somebody had to lose it. Yeah. And then you, when you take that over to like business world, it's like, well, in order for me, in order for them to win, I have to lose. Or in order for uh, me to win, I have to take and someone else has to lose. And it's like, no, that's actually not the case at all in fact if you can't be doing business in a situation that's win-win that's like where all parties are benefiting growing and it's like an equal exchange of value it should not be happening and the reality is that like i've been i've been in relationships in situations where i'm aware of the fact that somebody else is a shark that they're actively trying to take from me and uh had a very hard time to be able to draw a line create boundaries or them from my life and um it's been uh so i get that like if pete like the hardest part is like i mean the very first step is becoming aware of it right like realizing you have a problem like there could be people in your life that like whether you realize it or not they're like they're exuding the fact that they're like they're restraining you with what they think is possible like no you can't do that yeah, that can't be it's, done and it's not that's not the way to do it and it's not always business relationships. No, no, it, it isn't. It doesn't have to be business it's relationships. People that need you to kind of stay where you are because they would something about their life would be threatened if you transcended in your own. Yeah, I and see it, that it, a lot. It, that was that was a big thing, especially like when I first made the transition to go take control of my life. Like literally, it was like uh, I mean, the things that my my friends would say behind my back, and it was like in their it was like their whisper campaign to like keep me where I was. Like, totally. like it was like they like my own aunt because she couldn't understand like when I start talking about digital marketing concepts, drying traffic, buying media, scaling companies, developing and designing software. It's like he must be scamming people. Like literally told my mom, my mom at Thanksgiving dinner four years ago. Like I already have a wildly successful. I just don't even talk about it with them anymore. Right. Um, wildly successful business, and they she genuinely had to ask me like Cameron, you don't take advantage of people, do you? 
it was because of that like win lose mentality. Like my mom and other people thought that like I was a shark that like in order for me to be winning and having such, so much success, I must've been taking from somebody else. Mm. Um, and it was like really, um, telling. And so I didn't like when my parents didn't really support all the changes and transitions that I was making, like in all honesty, the very first of these, um, relationships where I had to separate myself a little bit was actually from my parents is like hard as that is because they were like, they were my number one fans. They supported me so much, but they were also the ones telling me the things that weren't possible that couldn't be done. Like there was like a, like I'm, it's one of those things where it's like, they see you as their, their child, right? Yeah. Like yeah. They put a ceiling on me and they had this box and I was like, I refuse to live inside of that box with that label inside of that. So I stopped sharing all the things that I was doing. And every now and again, I'd let something like slip out, something that I was proud of, some new number, some new client that I had taken on, some like new thing and, and accomplishment that I had, um, that I had hit. Um, some new big milestone and then there would be like this like belittling statement how much of that did you get to keep and it's like forget i said anything right but i can remember um e even was, though the answer to that question was probably still more than they made in a year somehow they would it would they would denigrate the situation because it's like oh well and they didn't even mean bad by it but it was like yeah they were just i don't i don't even know what the intention was really and I know that the intention was when they were trying to like, like, dude, I, I had built multiple million dollar business at this point. Like I had three really successful and they were still telling me that I, that they really wished that I would finish my electrical apprenticeship so that I had something to fall back on. You know, what's so funny is, so, you know, you, you uh, probably a month or two ago, I was at Funnel Hacking Live and I won a couple eight figure awards. And so the two businesses uh, between them, one was one award was for a business that a funnel that did 14 million, and one was for 17 million. So it was 31 million dollars in revenue to win these two awards. And my wife was sharing it with a member of her family. They were kind of asking her about it, and well, what does that mean exactly? And she kind of explained it. And guess what the the, the their immediate question was? What? How much of that did he get to keep? It's right. Like it's when you so said ridiculous. that, I had like a a, a, a resonant response to it i'm like seriously that is like the most cynical question it's such a nef like a, a nefarious like passive aggressive underhanded question it, it, it is it's very passive aggressive it's like i'm proud of the revenue that my business created but you and then it's like you almost want to i felt the need to like i want to come back and be like yeah i operate at 60 percent margins in my business so yeah, but, but it's like they wouldn't even know what that meant <laughs> exactly exactly and, <laughs> but i can and, remember and, and yet they wonder why it is that we try to we we generally try to limit who we surround ourselves with but here's the here's the so i got a really funny story to follow this up with um so it's um i spend my winters on the ski uh, um, snowboarding typically and my parents have a place nearby here and uh i went down i was spending some time with i never talk business or anything with them because because of this but i, I, I love they're my parents right. love them love them to death and i will i will take care of them um and uh that's I can powerful having a conversation said, by the way i want to let that sink in for a minute before you can go on but i didn't mean to interrupt but like that yeah. was powerful and uh the uh my dad's birthday was coming up and I invited them to come down to Las Vegas. And, um, they didn't really know what that meant. So like I had a car, pick them up from the airport. I was giving them the full experience. And at the time I had a business, um, we had an office, we had about a 20,000 square foot office there in Las Vegas. And I had a full on up this one company. Um, we just hit stride, um, inside of two years, we went from zero to over $40 million in sales. And we had a place, um, I had a place that, uh, just it was like over right by Wayne Newton's place just on south of the strip and it's like it was like in a an estate like so I, they literally pull up in this thing and they're coming up to the gate and they're coming through the estate and they're just like they're silent they have no idea what's going on I'm introducing them to my the my CFO and my sales manager um, my director of operations my CTO my direct my my chief technology officer and these are all people that are around their age and these were all and they were just like they were just dumbfounded they're like wait what and it was like the first time that they had ever got to see or experience what i had done or created or accomplished and they were just like i'm literally walking around with them. we actually have video footage of this somewhere um 
my friend Dakota sat them down, they're running this interview, they're like we had no idea. And it was just, it was really funny, but it's just like, I just stopped sharing that side of my life because it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It, it has nothing to do with anything, but I can just remember seeing like them getting to experience the things that I had created. And I take my dad out and I toss him the keys to my car. It was a brand new uh, 2017 Huracan at the time. And it was my, it was my dream car. The 10 year old me always wanted a Lamborghini and he's just mm -hmm. like, just dumbfounded. I was like, yeah, let's take her for a rip. And then I take them over to my office. I'm showing around, like we had a 20,000 square foot office, all this stuff going on. And they literally pull out their phone and they ask, um, it was my operations manager who was coming around with me, Joe. And they asked him like, can you take a picture? We want to get a picture of Cameron in a startup. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they just you didn't... missed the chance to be supportive and say that you wanted to be a part of us. The startup was years ago right. <laughs> when I was struggling in the basement, staying up late at night, reading books and doing all this stuff. Like this isn't a startup. This is a very successful company now. Like this is, this is good. <laughs> but it was like, it was almost like I, I was slightly offended from, from that, but I was just, I was just really glad to have a chance to share that time with them, give them a really cool experience, take them out and really treat my parents, treat my dad for his, um, for his birthday. It was his 59th birthday at the time, I believe. Hmm. And, um, but it was, it was the look on their face. <laughs> it, that's actually such a powerful story because your dad's 59 years old and it may, that may have been for him in a way, the same moment that you had with the owner of the paintball team, but because you were 19 or whatever, when that moment happened, it was able to have a, a different impact on your life than maybe at 59, you know, and it's, it takes, it, it takes, it, you know, my therapist always says, he says, insight is not therapy because insight doesn't change anyone experience is therapy because you only change through experience right and so it takes an experience for most people to kind of cast off the the trapping and the the strictures of the world and and what they've been taught right it's like you have to experience something out of the ordinary to ever imagine anything out of the ordinary and and you did that for him it sounds like it totally rocked their world. And, and, and I suspect, you know, he, I doubt that he went back to Canada and changed his whole trajectory and became a, a founder at 60 and, you know, became an entrepreneur. But at some level, you changed his life with that experience. I, I'm, I'm confident of it, you know? Now, he gets, now he's just showing all of his friends him ripping around in my car. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 but at some level, you opened his eyes to a perspective and an experience and a and a, a joie de vivre that maybe he never even really understood before. It's true. And I just took him out because I'm doing some renovations on my home out in the Cayman right now. And we're doing some renovations there. And I, I brought him out because I'm, I'm in the, pro I'm trying to get him to retire. He has the ability to retire. I already have the mm -hmm. financial plan and everything in place. Like I'm trying to give him something to do to like take part of. Cause like I, I genuinely believe in my goal since, I mean, my goal wasn't when I got started, wasn't to, um, it was just to be able to work at home for myself. But now right. my goal since then has been about like creating like generational wealth. And like, I've set up like the George family trust. Like I've set things in motion to be able to create generational wealth, to ensure that my parents are taken care of, that they're able to retire all these things. And I'm in that process now where like we had, there's the, he could retire right now if I could get him to do it. But anyway, I bring him out, like he'll never stop working. So I was trying to show him like how he could keep working. I put together a little plan for him. I was like, here's how you could literally make six times the amount of money that you're making right now doing a fraction of the work in a time period that you want to, still being an electrician. Um, and I brought him out to the, um, to the Cayman there and we were working on uh, meeting with the contractors, finalizing a lot of details and stuff for the house. And we're sitting there one night and it was one of the first times since then that I really started talking about business. I started talking about like my vision for business and what I wanted to do, what I wanted to structure and kind of like some of the strategy and the intention behind it. And I realize I'm like, oh, I'm pretty much talking this whole dinner. Like, I feel like I'm running a seminar and I look at him and he's just so in there and he's like, where did you learn all of this? And he's just enamored. Like, how do you, how are you my child? Like, where did this come from? I don't understand where this information is available, how this trans, like how these things, and it was like that moment where he's sitting there and he's looking at like the wall, these things, he's looking at the 10 year difference but see the whole time through that 10 years, he didn't even know that changes were happening. 
we just got to have these nice family dinners and be together and stuff. We didn't mm -hmm. know anything that was happening, but now all of a sudden he's just like, how is this wall built? <laughs> it's funny because I, I knew you for those 10 years. I mean, that's yeah. about the 10 years that I've known you. And I've been, you know, as your friend and fan, I've been keenly aware of the change, you know. <laughs> and it's interesting to think that I actually, in a way, probably over that 10 years, knew more about your real life than your own parents. Yeah. And we weren't even working together. I was just watching, you know, f as a spectator, right? Doing my own thing. Yeah. And, it, and that, if that isn't a powerful ex, sort of example of what we're talking about, about the, the insularity that starts to form when you really, really commit to doing whatever you have to do to become whoever you're committed to becoming, that in a way your, your random friends who you, meet, who, who you meet along the way who are kind of in the same lane as you end up knowing you perhaps better or in a different way than your own family for at least, at least in that part of your life because you have more things to relate and understand about. Yeah. And it is, it's super interesting. And now that I have a daughter of my own, I can, I'm just, I can see myself being very consciously and acutely aware. Like, so for instance, um, Terry Crews, the mm -hmm. actor, um, sure. he builds computers and plays video games with his children because it's like, he wants to, he's like, it's not about them getting them interested in what I'm interested in. It's about me taking a keen interest in what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't help but become obsessed about sales, marketing, business, and finance. Like it just, and I genuinely believe that like, the only real education is self-education. Like I don't need some piece of paper to tell me that I know something. Like I know right. it because it, there's an, there's an example of it in my life. <laughs> well, it's kind of the same thing I said about therapy. I mean, all, all school, all knowledge is experiential. It's not insightful. It is. And that's kind of a hard thing for a lot of people to want to get their, their head around, but it, it is, it's, it's true. And it's just, but it's like, now we get back to the point of like, we're talking about these kind of ridiculous things and it's like, but how, what was the difference? What were the deciding factors? And I can remember you, you kind of said the, you made a point on it. You touched on it earlier. Um, and I can remember I can remember really like when I started first, like really setting goals and dreaming, like allowing myself to dream and like thinking of my perfect day and like imagining and being grateful for like a life of luxury and lifestyle and happy and for like the relationship that I wanted, the homes that I wanted, the cars that all the, the business that I wanted to have. And I started like consciously like intending for that. I can remember there was one moment I was spending the year because <clears throat> I was spending years after that, after I, I went full-time online in 2010 and I just kind of like sold my house in Edmonton. I started traveling and doing things. And um, for a few years there, I was sampling different ski resorts, seeing like where I wanted to get a home in the mountains or what resort right. I wanted to ride. And I did a full year out at Whistler and I can remember I was there and I was listening to an audio book, which is also telling of something that <laughs> I believe successful people do is they're always constantly taking in new knowledge, new information. Um, and I'm pumping gas in my truck at the gas station. And I just had this moment where I realized I'm like, wow, for the first time ever, I felt that like I had embodied, like when I was thinking of and dreaming for a long time, I was thinking of all the stuff that I wanted to have because like when I first got started, I was a consumer, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? All the stuff and the things that I wanted to have. Um, and it was in that moment that I realized I was like, I when I was daydreaming about all those things, I was imagining myself in a different way. I had a different level of confidence, the way that I carried myself, the knowledge that I had, all of these things. It was in that moment when I was standing there in Whistler pumping gas that I realized that like for the first time ever, like I had to become the person that was in that vision that whole time. Hmm. You know what I mean? And I was just like, it was, I was so focused externally and all the other stuff that this, right. the moment that I turned it on myself, I'm like, I am that person. I just spoken at my first event in front of like 1500 people. I just done these. And I just like realized how I was showing up. Like I was like, I had this thirst for knowledge and information. And I just like, I loved getting up in the morning and getting to go like work out and have fun and go snow. And it's like, I, I, I just realized that like I had become this person. I went from like this negative depressed sad 
confused individual in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where I didn't, all I knew is that I didn't even want to get out of bed. I could sleep for 24 hours all day, every day, because I just didn't want to get out of bed to go to a job that I didn't want to be at Mm -hmm. to now like excited to get up, to go like explore and play and realize that like, I'm in control of my own life and I can play this game however I want. And I believe that anybody has the ability to do that, that like they can set themselves up. They can set up and design a life, a lifestyle. It doesn't have to be building million dollar businesses. It can be anything, but like a true sense of like freedom can come from like realizing and understanding like the type of freedom that they have, that they can have right now and the choices and the actions that they get to take and that they can, that they can play inside of. And it's like, I've, I've really made a conscious effort to make the transition from having to do work to getting to work on things that I yeah. want to and making it as playful as possible. Because that's what makes things sustainable over long periods of time. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. I mean, first of all, I want to say thanks for being so like trans, just really vulnerable and transparent through this whole conversation. I feel like emotionally impacted by some of the things that you shared and I love that you kind of arrived at this moment where you're like hey this is my story these are my experiences but the the ultimate outcome is a product of really very universal things things at least there that are at least universal right now in the world we live in which are you know the hunger and thirst for knowledge coupled with the availability of self-education for people that are willing to invest time, energy, potentially money into what's out there in in, in a way that may seem non-traditional, may get you teased or mocked or scorned by people that think you should only go to school and that's the only place to learn. But if you can get over that, it's like, hey, this is all actually out there, right? You're, you know, your dad's saying, where did all this knowledge come from? And you're like, well, dad, remember that 60 grand you gave me such a hard time about? Like, that was part of it, at least, you know. But so you're kind of saying, like, you know, if you have the thirst, it's all out there. And, and, and what you're, to me, what you're demonstrating is that it's about, it's about energy. It's about application. It's about focus. And that, and that if you have the vision of your life, what I think you're saying is the tools exist. Like, 500 years ago, wanting certain things in this world was asinine because the tools didn't exist. Like you couldn't want to sell products all over the world 500 years ago. You couldn't want to live on top of a mountain and have money deposited into your bank account electronically. Like the tools didn't exist. But now, I mean, I don't know what, I'm sure 50 years from now, people will look at now and be like, oh, remember back then when it was so hard? Like from where (laughs) I'm sitting, shit's gotten really easy, man. Exponentially easier, dude. When I first got started, I had to learn how to code to set up a website. Now it's as easy as like, like if you, if you have a Facebook account, you know more, you know, it's harder to set up a Facebook account than it is to build a website these days. Yeah. And it's like, and, I had and, to learn code. That's the friggin' fabric of the internet. Like but think technology about keeps building on itself. It couldn't be any easier. No, it, it really it's, couldn't. It's the crazy. side effect of that though, is that it's changing so quickly that the longer you wait to like get started in something, the further behind you are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you know, it's funny though. You just said 10 years ago, you had to, but yeah, even, it wasn't even ago, an option. Like you had to. But you could have reframed that to say 10 years ago, you got to. That's true. Because compare 10 years ago to 20 years ago. And at 20 years ago, if you had said, listen, man, just wait 10 years and you're going to get to learn this language and you're going to get this to have this machine in your house. And if you learn the language and you do this work, you're going to get to create these pages and people all over the world will see your stuff and you get money. It's like, it's always a privilege at whatever oh, stage it's at, you know, and if it's, if, if you started a year ago and you're like, man, it, it, I wish I'd started 10 years ago, but now I see it's easier and it's not fair. Whether it's unfair because you should have done it before or it's unfair because you should have waited. Like, who cares? It's always a privilege. Whenever, however, wherever. Own the moment you live in. My God, most of the people in human history had to basically move dirt to survive. Yeah. And it was funny. To, I was... Uh... Who's these? 
It was funny because it was, I've never heard it in this, I've never thought about it in this context before. Uh, I took on an, uh, an intern uh, not that long ago and we were having a conversation. I'm having candid conversations like this all day. Um, and uh, I was telling him, I was like, it's funny because I used to always think that I had to do labor to make money or make an income. And now I just talk for money and income. <laughs> it's like I speak, I speak for it now. I used to think that I had to labor for it and now I speak for it. It's crazy. But it makes sense. It, but I've never, like, I've never thought about it in that context before, but I was like, it's, it's technically true. It is, and, and yet we've been saying for years that we live in an information economy. Information is packaged with words most of the time, right? Yeah. So it kind of stands to reason that a, a word maker, i.e. a voice with a message, could generate an income. Yeah, it really comes down to being able to communicate effectively, which is really all sales even is. Yeah, which by the way, I still have on my screen over here, the professor salaries. So the communication professor, the average communication professor makes $95,000 a year. Oh my God. Meanwhile, um, there was a poll done recently and it was, it was a few hundred um, wealthy individuals. I believe the lowest income of them was, it was over just over a hundred million dollars a year. And they asked them, oh, I got to find this article. The, the poll was basically asking them what they believed was the number one deciding factor in their success. And they said um, it was sales experience, learning sales. And to most people, they're like, pushing things on people taking from somebody like that's like our our the undertone the common belief of what sales is when the reality is that like sales is effective communication it's all it is I remember the one time i did a speed the very first time i spoke on stage was actually about this i was teaching consultative sales and um i asked because like i could just tell everybody in the audience had like there was like they were like repulsed by talking about sales and i was like i had to stop and i was like who in here has a negative association with sales pretty much the whole audience put their hand up and i was like okay i was like well uh how many of the gentlemen in the room are married a bunch of you guys put their hand up i was like how'd you sell your wife on that idea <laughs> like sales is not like it's yeah it's, an and idea. it's effective communication like whatever movie you went to last week with your friend, like somebody sold you on that. Like that, that's everything is nothing happens until something's sold. Good, good sales is just effectively explaining a win-win opportunity. Yeah. Just letting somebody know the benefits. And, and so yet, and yet, and yet the people that are teaching our communication have only been able to sell themselves on average to $95,000 a year income level. That's not somebody you should be learning communication from. No, just it's not. I mean, there. not to be a jerk, but that's actually not. A, a, this We're talking about a person that has devoted their career to studying communication. And the best they've been able to do for themselves is sell themselves to, what's that, eight grand a month? Gross? Pre-tax? And, they're an, and that's, a, that's, a, that's considered a, a PhD level a communicator? Yeah. No, it, it's, we live in a, we live in a jacked up world, man. It just, I just, I mean, well, the crazy thing is, cause you were talking about before. So you're familiar with Moore's law. Moore's law basically yeah. states that like technology will double at the rate of every, what is like every two like 20, years, every four 21 years. 21 or 22 months or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it doubles every, but it's like when it, when it, what Moore's law really says is any technology that has been information enabled will double at that rate. So it's like you almost look at, <clears throat> so it's like my grandfather, for instance, who only had the ability to do so much. I mean, the information that he had access to would have been like the surrounding towns in Newfoundland. Right. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like they had their community or our parents, like they technically had the internet, but they didn't use it in the same capacity that we do. Um, like my dad doesn't have Facebook. My mom does now. Um, but uh, the access that they had to information. And it's like, I really look at, Cause it's created this like exponential growth, like 10 years ago, like when I came online, when I made this decision to start a business and do stuff, it was literally like the moment that I became information enabled. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's why people see this, like they see the exponential growth and they can't comprehend the contrast, but it's like. That's a, it's actually, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that that's illuminating for me that that is the change is that we became, and we, it happened to both of us around the same time. For me, it was like late 2008, early 2009. It was, that was when I became information enabled and I was able to start achieving 
some proportionality in my life between the acquisition of new high quality information and the growth of leverage, essentially the ability to leverage the acquisition of new information to produce an, a compounding result. Yeah, that was it the just started to build on itself because yeah. the new information unlocked new opportunities and the new opportunities unlocked new information. And it started to build on itself, just like with technology and Moore's law, you see that you use the old technology to build the new technology. It's the same thing you're seeing with like the growth in like the new technology is what's building the new technology is building the new technology. That's why it's like, you don't have to write code anymore. It's like to build a website is just clicking on little mm -hmm. things you can use. Like there's video games now where you play the video game to build and create a video game. Mm -hmm. The video game development is a video game. Yeah. And it's it, like, it's new technology that, and it comes from being information enabled. And most people like, they can't even comprehend exponential growth. And if you use this analogy, and I, I always say this to people all the time, just to like, it just plants that little seed because you never know what will happen. It's like, would you prefer a million dollars right now, cash, or a penny doubling every day for 30 days? Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, I asked this question to my mom. She's like, million dollars, of course. I was like, why? She's like, what am I going to do with, she's like, what am I going to do with like a couple hundred bucks? I was like, it's doubling every day for 30 days. And like the penny doubling every day for 30 days is an example of the, the doubling, the Moore's law, how you're going mm -hmm. to achieve exponential growth. And it's like the penny doubling every day for 30 days is over $5 million. It's way more than the $1 million now, but yeah, it's continually was... and consistently doubling. And it's like most people can't, they think linearly that something mm -hmm. is going to maintain the same rate of growth that it always has. And they can't comprehend that like information literally is the game changer that allows something to grow exponentially. I was on a, I was on a, a, a conversation earlier that I recorded with, with a guy that I'm, I'm actually excited to release. And we were talking about, um, he said, he was talking about, he's been thinking lately about like, what is a billion dollars? Like, like, like what, what is it conceptually in terms of what it takes to create, to sort of create that as a, you know, a, a concept, like a whole paradigm. It's like a different level of thought to think about a billion dollars is like a realistic thing, right? And I was like, you know, I've been thinking, I, I owned it. I was like, I've been thinking about it too lately. I actually bought a shirt. I got, had a shirt design that says billionaire in the making. And like, I, I pretend that I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just joking, you know, like I'm kind of, you know, have this little smirk when I wear it. But I'm like, really though, what is a billion dollars? And I was thinking about it. So if you basically want to 10x in 10 years if my math is right i think you have to achieve about 25 percent a year compound growth because you have 25 percent a year you're going to double in three years which means you're going to quadruple in six years which means you're going to 800 percent in nine years so you'll get pretty close to about 10x in 10 years at 25 percent compounding right so if you started with, let's say $10 million and you were like 40 years old, I don't know. That sounds like maybe some guys I know ish. Because and you achieve it's more money. I mean, if you look at uh, what Warren Buffett had, I think he only had just over a million dollars when he was in his early thirties. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was reading about Grant Cardone the other day. Uh, I was listening to an interview with him and I think when he was 40, he had, you know, he was successful. He had several million bucks. Right now he runs $1.7 billion real estate fund. 25% um, of your return is that's a, that's an ambitious return, but for an entrepreneur, for somebody who's got a mechanism in their life to leverage new information, that's not, that's not ridiculous. That's not parabolic. And no. yet if you did it for 20 years, you'd turn $10 million into a billion dollars. Right, like a whatever the number is, maybe somebody's starting at a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe somebody's starting. The crazy thing is how big those numbers seem. Like, because I used to think that like six figures a month was like a ridiculous amount of money because I was I was thinking about it in the context of like what my dad had to trade forty to sixty hours a week for in order to earn in the terms of a salary with a very um, well known job in the trades, and like I kept it in that framework, which felt very small, but when uh, which it made it feel really big. Sorry, I should say, 
But when you start thinking about like how small that is in the term of like world economics, the amount of traffic and revenue and stuff that can be generated online, like it's so small. And I think that's where like people don't really realize what's possible. They even hear big numbers. Um, they think that some of the numbers that we're talking about is big. And meanwhile, we're sitting here with this dirty little secret that like, no, we're not even doing a fraction of what we're capable of. Our operations aren't nearly as good as what they could be. Our marketing isn't close to dialed to what it could be. And they're looking at it like it's this huge thing. And we're like, it's shit. It's terrible. <laughs> but it's <laughs> not anywhere I, of what it can be and what's possible. Um, but it's because of the, just the difference in the understanding of markets and, 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 and possibility. Like for one of my companies, we had an affiliate that used to send us over a million dollars per month in revenue. It was one person. It was one affiliate that was doing advertising. And it's just like that. Those numbers are like the earth. I know, I know who you're talking about. And they were just using one platform. Yeah. They were just using one traffic source. Like they could have technically done more if they wanted to. Right. It's, and, but yeah, it's just it, like those numbers, they sound so crazy until you start putting them into like context of what businesses are doing, what's possible, the number of people and consumers and buyers of products. And it's like when you look at larger markets, like the affiliate marketing industry is over an $8 billion a year industry and it's growing every year. It's like 90% of online purchases happen through an affiliate program where somebody is paid and compensated for that to be happening, for that transaction. I, uh, I think that, you know, we talk a lot about compounding, you know, Einstein said it's the eighth wonder of the world and those who understand it, earn it and those who don't pay it. Right. Um, I think there's something else that compounds with people that do really extraordinary things. And it's something that I really try to lean into in my life that every, that I think conventional wisdom is totally wrong about because everybody tells you, you should pursue the opposite. And it's, dissatisfaction. I don't know that many really successful people that are ever satisfied. I don't know any. It's kind I of a paradox. It is. I think there's something incredibly powerful about maintaining, almost like stoking your dissatisfaction in your life. Because when we talk about compound interest, I mean, there's, there's I love math. Because, and this is why I say I understand how people can get argue about religion and all argue about politics. I don't understand they can argue about money because money is just math. Like, would you rather have, if somebody said, hey, I'll pay you uh, 10% a year return on your money, and would you like that to compound monthly or compound daily? You'd rather have it compound daily, right? Because it's, it's a little bit more. And over time, it's a lot more. Dissatisfaction to me, if you can increase the compounding, or I should say decrease the compounding interval, increase the compounding frequency of the dissatisfaction in your life, projected over the course of a life, it'll change everything. Like I try to be dissatisfied by like the minute. You know, some people have like once a day, they're like, oh, I hate my job. I'm like, ugh. Some people it's like once a month. They're like, man, I can't wait for a three day weekend. I want to be dissatisfied every single minute because then like I'll do just a little bit more. A little bit more. And here's the thing, superficially, I have a great life. I have to work at being dissatisfied. And, and, and my get, I mean, am I onto something here? No, you are. And I actually, I was watching, so every morning when I get up, so I go snowboarding every morning to start my day. Oh, how dissatisfying. Come on, man. <laughs> so I, I get up and, uh, and I always have, I, I turn my garage into my boardroom where it's like, it's this man cave with snowboards all over the wall, big TV. It's like a walk-in closet for snowboarding, all of my jacket. And I have a big TV in there where I play snowboard videos every day, every in the morning. It's in the background as I'm getting ready, music, having my smoothie, getting ready to go out and do my morning exercise. And um, I had, there was one on, it was Mark McMorris, who's a young Canadian snowboarder. He's arguably one of the most um, accomplished competitive ever. And um, he was talking about how he holds this ideal where basically he's saying like he will always be dissatisfied because his ideal of what he wants to accomplish is impossible. It defies physics. It defies reason. It defies logic. And he's like one of the first people that was landing like triple cork backflips in competition. And you watch these guys and where they're progressing and going. And you're like, five years ago, you couldn't even imagine that it was getting there. But he's still pushing and progressing the sport in a way that most people can't comprehend. And what he says, the key to that is, is the fact that he, he knows that he's holding this insane ideal that he wants to reach and that it's not even physically possible. 
but that's what keeps him pushing and growing. So like, I agree with you because to me, I'm like, it's a paradox because I don't want to be satisfied and like upset and unhappy. But at the same time, I totally agree with you because I hold this ideal of what's possible that I always compare the current reality to in the sense of like what I want to push and grow to. But then there's still this sense of like, of like gratitude and presence to enjoying the ride. Because I mean, there is no, there's no destination of getting anywhere. The right. key to success, I believe, is enjoying the journey. So it's like, there's this paradox of like, I want to be dissatisfied to, to maintain a level of growth because there's a level of like, I mean, Tony Robbins says this as well, that like true happiness and fulfillment comes from like a place of, of growth. Like if you're not growing, you're, yeah, you're dying, progress. you're happiness deteriorating. Progress, right? Yeah, it's progress. So it's like, it's having these huge ideals that you can contrast to. So it maintains the state of growth, like you're saying, but then you can also make, but that you can also have the state of like, of like love and gratitude and presence and fun and playfulness in the moment, because you could, there's almost a detachment where like, I'm dissatisfied with the way that things are right now. But I also know that the growth is inevitable because I know what's possible, where I can grow, where I can go and what it's, what's happening. And I'm grateful for the fact that it's already done and that it's accomplished. And it's like, there's this dissatisfaction in the, in the, in the contrast, but then I'm like super grateful and playful and happy with it now. And there's a really good example. So when I first started marketing and promoting online i was making so many mistakes i was writing like ezine articles the squidoo was a thing back then I, oh, um i was on myspace facebook wasn't even a thing yet mm-hmm. and uh there's all sorts of social platforms it was still the wild west it wasn't called social media it was called web 2.0 um <laughs> Remember those days? Oh, I do. Um, I, I just can't believe you said Squidoo, man. Right? That, well, dude, at one point, stress. that was a strategy. I literally sat down. I would yeah. write Squidoo lenses every day on topics they, that I was And they optimized towards. really well. They ranked. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can remember I started to put out these um, these videos on YouTube. And I I ended up getting the YouTube channel got shut down because I, like, I used this software to like really push a strategy. And I broke YouTube's terms and conditions and I took my right. channel down, but I had this channel at one point where I was putting out, um, I was just putting out content and I had this message in my inbox on YouTube one time and it was from this lady, like she didn't know me from Adam and I'm 21 years old, 22 years old at the time. And she said, congratulations on being a millionaire before you're 30. And I was like, it hit me for a moment. I remember having this moment where I was like, shit, she's right. Like it's inevitable. Like I am dissatisfied with my situation right now, but I can also, there's a part of me that can like relax and let go and be grateful for the fact that that is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is such an interesting paradox. It is, it's this paradox, right? Yeah, it's like, I recognize that dissatisfaction is the fuel and I'm, but I'm super grateful for my, my, my body and my mind and the fact that I am the engine dissatisfied but but and so it's like you know if you if all you had was fuel but no in no engine you you know you just have a, a fire hazard but i'm grateful that i have dissatisfaction as fuel but my the, but that i was gifted with the natural ability not you know not not extraordinary i'm not like i don't have a 44 inch vertical or anything i'm just saying like i have arms and, and a mouth and you know a thoughts and and pr- a pretty intense desire and I can do shit, you know, and I'm super, you're right. I'm super grateful for that. Now I have a family that loves me too. And I'm extra grateful for that. It's like, yeah, you have to savor the process, but you can't ever let savoring turn in to, to satisfaction or complacence or stagnation. You know, I think about people use the term, they're like, I want hockey stick growth, right? Like in, in VC funds are like, you know, where's the, we want to go parabolic. And people think of of a parabola as like this in math, it's like this rapidly ascending arc. But I like this other concept too. What a parabola actually is, is a line, a a curved line that's approaching a straight line but never actually touches it, right? That's that's the ideal. The straight line is the ideal. Yeah, it'll never never reach the ideal as long as you, and, and that's the thing, like information education, like it really does keep continue to expand like what's possible. And I can remember I was working with, uh, I had hired a consultant that was helping me like really kind of get clear on, 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 on my message and the thing that I want to be known for so that I could help and work with my coaching and my consulting clients better. And um, he was kind of like, 
you're on stage, you're in front of an audience of me and my peers right now are running seven and eight figure businesses. He's like, what is the one thing you want us to know? And I was like, the one thing I want you to know is that you don't understand what's possible or you'd already be doing it. Mm. <laughs> Honestly, dude, I think I needed to hear that. I really did, man. And it's like that it's powerful in a way. And like, to me, that's always like the, that's the first step. And it could like, it could be the simple thing of like real and like, that's always the key to the next level and expanding that ideal that's going to impact growth. And it's like, it's, it, it almost fits back into this, into this idea that like, so for instance, you have 30 days to accomplish this goal. How long, uh, whatever this goal is, how long is it going to take you to accomplish it? Most people are gonna be like, well, the 30 days, I'm going to use it. What if I put a gun to your head and I tell you that your family is done if you don't have it done by next week? What are you going to do? You're going to get it done by next week. And it honestly doesn't really matter what it is. If like the, the you, we collapse time frames in order to get things done. And what I find is that um, when people only realize that so much is possible, they play and act as if they have forever to get this done. Hmm. When you expand out what it can be, they realize they're like, shit, this is just step one. I need to get this done now in the next seven days so that I can move on to the next thing. Right. And I've really seen that happen with, with clients where it's like, I'm working with somebody that's trying to make the leap from like running a multiple six figure year business to a seven figure year business. And um, you can just tell the way that they think about their business, the way that they're operating in their business, like it's different. And part of one of the things that I had realized when I was working with a client was like, there was no urgency because they didn't even really understand the ideal of what they should be building towards mm -hmm. hmm. or what they could be building towards. Yeah. I love that concept. And, and Grant Cardone talks about that. His 10 X rule. A lot of people think the 10 X rule is actually two rules. And one of them is things are going to be basically it's things are going to be 10 times harder than you thought. So just be prepared for that. Right. And that's mm -hmm. the one everybody gloms onto like, okay, I gotta, I gotta be willing to endure more than I would have otherwise. But actually the other, the, the rule that's far more interesting to me in his, his book is about thinking 10 times bigger than you ever thought possible before. Because, and I think it's what you just nailed it. When you expand the horizon of possibility, then the thing that you were giving yourself time to accomplish suddenly becomes a smaller piece of a much bigger puzzle. And it's like, shit, I got to get this done now because I got a whole lot more to do. And when I get on with clients and I, and I do this with them sometimes, they almost get like upset. There's pushback because there's a sense of overwhelm, but overwhelm is the first like touch that like you're getting to expansion. Like I want to overwhelm you because I mean, it's systems theory, right? It's how do you build bigger muscles? I want to strain and stress them to the point of failure so they can grow back strong enough to be able to deal with that all over again. Like you overload a, sim a system so that it can reorganize in a more effective, efficient manner so that it can handle that load. So it's almost like I, they feel overwhelmed with this idea and this possibility. And then it's like, okay, now that we're overwhelmed, let's restructure, let's simplify things. Let's come back to the things that we need to do now because it's just given a whole new perspective and a whole new context to what needs to be done now. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation, man, because it's for me, I mean, you know, we talk a lot and like for what I'm trying to do now with my career and with my brand and with my education business, I'm basically have just done what you just described. I've, I've literally exponentially expanded what I think is possible for us and what we're doing. And now I'm, I am, I'm recalibrating and refactoring and, and re reorganizing all my systems to get it done. You know, I used to think social media was like this thing I needed to do in my business. Now, because I've been studying guys like, you know, Dan Locke, now I realize social media is actually a thing I need a team of 10 or 20 people to do as a, as a division within my business. And that, but that's because I completely expanded the scope of what I think my business can accomplish. And so now it's like, well, there's no way I could do all that. I literally need a team, right? And that's just one place where, it, and, and it's actually where at first it made it seem so overwhelming because now it's like, okay, everything has to be perfect. When I make a YouTube video, I need to actually go back through and comb back through the entire video and, and create a description that has timestamps of, of different things that were talked about in the video. And I need to make sure that the video was concepted right with optimization for keywords. And I need to start doing keyword research even before I decide what I'm going to do a video about. And like, 
that's just YouTube. And then the, there's a whole other strategy for Facebook because Facebook has different compliance. And if I'm going to boost the video, there's some content I can put on YouTube that I can't even boost on Facebook. And like, ah, 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 right? So there can be so much depth. And, and that's it, where people it, don't understand what's possible. It feels overwhelming at first, but then if you, if you, the only way out of overwhelm is through. And if you stay in it long enough to let the systems reorganize and to do the work of participating in the reorganization, then it actually decreases the overwhelm because you've built a better, more scalable system. Yep. But, that, but most it's people- It's the thing that people want to better. avoid. It's the thing that people want to avoid. And it's really hard because part of me, like um, like one of the businesses and projects that I work on, it's similar to what you were, where it's like, I love helping people make that transition. Like, I mean, honestly, my ideal client is working with someone who has a wildly successful business and, and helping them optimize scale and automate it. Like that's my right. ideal, but there's still, there's a part of me that can't help, but, but want to reach down and share the information with with the 20 year old me that was out there, you know what I mean? Like who was just like hungry for knowledge and information. If somebody would just show me the direction. So it's almost like there's the, there's the uh, creating and delivery of content and curriculum of like everything that I wish that I knew and that I had. And when you see people trying to make that transition from an employee to an entrepreneur and being like from an employee making trading your dollars for hours, to being a self-sufficient independent entrepreneur and, and striving to achieve financial independence, financial security and financial freedom, like in that, like really seeing that trajectory in that order. Um, I really like, I, I'm really, pa I, there's a piece of me that just like can't help but want to share and give back there. But the thing that like drives me crazy is the microwave results at which people want. I want it in two months. I mm -hmm. want it in three months. I want it in six months. It's like, I was actually listening to a Joe Rogan podcast um, the other day. One of my guilty pleasures that now I get to do way more often because I have the time freedom is I, I play a lot of video games and I love having like ed either educational informational podcasts on running in the background. I was listening to this Joe Rogan podcast um, which is why actually I, I love even this format of what you're doing here now. I think this is the first time I've ever been party to this type of just conversational format um and uh he was talking about like it, it was one of the comics in his life said that like your career doesn't even like you don't even get started until after 10 years you're not even you don't even call yourself a comic until mm -hmm. you've been putting in time in stages for over 10 years and then they were talking about all these different careers and like they're all these different reference points were like yeah like 10 years is the starting point and i'm sitting there laughing because i mean i just came around the 10 year point and i'm like mm -hmm. I can relate with that a little, but at the same time, I'm like, I wish people really had that context and that bigger picture thinking, that macro perspective, looking at it things from a 40,000 foot view to realize like the actual benefits and outcomes of dedicating themselves, becoming a student of business and finance and like what it can really produce for them. And if they would let go of timeframes and just like, even just commit to the process of learning, applying and playing in their free time if they had to for 10 years what difference it would make in their life is just unfathomable and i can remember sitting down so um my better half's grandfather um was actually responsible for a lot of the oil pipelines in canada like he literally went and um he owned a, an oil business and like his close friends like one of them was a was the billionaire that created Syncrude Oil, which is the oil sands, the main oil sands company up in Fort McMurray, where I graduated high school. And um, he literally would go and he was like the type of person to literally be sitting down in like in the, we don't have, it's not called Congress in Canada, it's called something else, but I know more about US politics. Than <laughs> the, yeah. Yes, um, the General Assembly or something. Yeah, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and he'd be there, he'd be like basically lobbying and doing all the stuff to like, like we wouldn't live in the world in the Canada that we do today if it wasn't for him. And I, and like, he's kind of at this point where he's, he is such like, this is almost a ridiculous level of radical responsibility. He sees his life, he's sick coming to an end. So he's wrapping his life up so that he's not going to be a burden on anybody else. Like he's quite literally at this point where he feels like he's just waiting to, for it to be over. And he doesn't want to be a burden for anybody. He was wrapping all these things up. So but he's thought that now for years and he's still here and healthy. So I'm like, 
bothers me a little bit, but anytime <laughs> I get a chance to sit down with them, I'm like, I'm asking these questions as if like, if your next sentence were going to be the only thing that you could be remembered for that I could have a, I could have a little moment to be able to carry on your legacy and be able to share these words, what would it be? And he was telling me, he's like, I know it sounds simple, but as he's looking back over the impact that he's had on his life and all of his friends building billion dollar companies, He's like, it was this one friend that started Syncrude. And he's like, the one thing he really ingrained in me is that I need to think bigger. He's like, I used to think and I used to plan a year or two in advance. And I'd always hit my goals, of course. He's like, but he told me and he challenged me that if I didn't start thinking about 20 and 25 years out, that I was missing the entire point. And I like really started to think about that. And he's like, he's like the, and now this is talking to somebody that started setting 25 year goals and then looking back over the contrast of it. He's like, every time it would happen, he's like, we set these goals that we didn't think were possible. There were these insane ideals. He's like, but then you find yourself, you're seven, you're eight, these, these ridiculous coincidences, this new technology, all of a sudden something comes in that's compressing time frames, And all of a sudden this thing that was like, doubt that will ever happen in my lifetime becomes like something that we're doing inside of 10 years, not 25 anymore, because it became, it became possible. He's like, but it never would have those coincidences, those, uh, and I talk about it in the book of like thinking or not thinking rich, the science of getting rich, where they're talking about like this quantum soup. And it became like, what was the cause and the effect was, was my intention to create right. and accomplish this goal, the cause of this person's desire to invent it, or was their desire to invent this thing the cause and like you know what I mean like there was totally. all these, there's yeah. all these stories in there that was talking about companies that would set up to develop and accomplish a goal that the technology didn't even exist for yet and every time without fail by the time they got to that point of their plan the technology existed and he was just really emphasizing and harping on the fact that it's like you have to think bigger you have to if you don't have 25 year 20 and 25 year goals you're missing the point and you're missing an incredible opportunity. You're wasting time. Mm. And I'm just like, that like really rocked me. Cause then I started thinking about it too. I started looking at like Warren Buffett, like, and that's where I'm like, I'm delusionally, like I, I genuinely believe that if I wanted to, I could achieve a billion dollar net worth in my life and that it's mathematically inevitable at a very average returns and interest rates based on the growth that I'm experiencing right now, even if I were to maintain it at an, at a mediocre rate, but it's like to say that to somebody, because you start yeah. looking at and extrapolating things over 25, 30, 40 years, it starts to like, it starts to get a little crazy. And it's like most people, you, and you can extrapolate these things in multiple scenarios. It's like most people don't realize that the real cost of something isn't the cost that you're paying for it right now. You should actually multiply that cost times five because at very average return and in interest rates, um, over the course of, and basically what you take is it's like, if the average lifespan is 80 and you subtract your current life from that based on current interest rates, it's like, you see how many years of compounding growth you could right. have assets working for you. And it's like anybody who's 40, 50, even 60 years old, like they still have a long time that they could have assets and things working for them and they don't get it. Like I'm only 31 years old to think that I have 40 more years of potential growth of assets. It's like, I, I start to look at like the comment that that lady made about me by the time I was 30. And I start to realize that it's, again, it's math. It's mathematically inevitable. If I, if that's something that I would choose to pursue and go after, because obviously like you can't create a billion dollar net worth or value, um, or create that type of income or, uh, in the world without impacting, influencing, and serving a billion people in some way. Yeah, I, I, I like that you kind of brought it down to that, that it, it, at the end of the day, growth is about engagement and enrollment. You're not going to grow shit if you're not getting a whole lot of people enrolled in what you're doing. Yeah. And the way you get, and, and nobody's, nobody's there to build your thing. They're there, to build, they're there to build their thing. So the only way you get people enrolled is to serve them. Yeah. And, and people don't get that, that like even internally, because <clears throat> I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs when they're, because like you see entrepreneurs going through these, like, um, it's almost like the maturity of an entrepreneur. Like when you first get started, you're like really immature. 
And there's like these different maturity levels of entrepreneurialism. You know what I mean? Um, and when somebody, when you first get started, those entrepreneurs, it's almost like you're taking a stand because you've got this belief so hard in what you're believing in that you're like, yeah, building a business is the only way and the only thing to do. And you're like talking down to jobs. Right. And it's just like, totally. <laughs> versus like when you get further, it's like, no, I want to honor everybody where they're at. Like there's nothing wrong with having a job. The only thing that I think that's wrong in the world is not doing something that you're actually passionate about and believe in. It's totally fine to have a job and to be part of a team, a company, a vision and a mission that's mm -hmm. greater than yourself and to be able we, to contribute we would be pretty to be part screwed of it. If nobody was willing to have a job, I mean, I don't definitely couldn't do what I do. Yeah. But it even comes down to enrollment though. Cause there's like, there's the external and there's the internal in the sense of like of your organization. And it's like, how are you enrolling your executives, your team members, your, your assistant, your, the people inside hey. your business that like that they can accomplish, that they can reach, accomplish and achieve the wildest goals of their dreams and that there's room and space for it inside of by participating and being a part of you and your organization. Yeah. And like, and like, what are we, what are we building? Like, what are we building together? And, and, and I have a job and my job simply maybe is to lead the building effort, but like, we're all just building. Right. And, and I, I totally, I'm totally with you on that. I, I think about it a lot and to the, and I, and I, I want to kind of hone this conversation into the, the person, you know, I like to, I created this YouTube channel and what ultimately grew into a podcast. I created it. I think you said the same thing earlier. I created this in my case for the 20 year old version of me. And I think you addressed the 20 year old version of you earlier too. Like it's, you do, you reach a point where it's like, I wanna serve the 20 year old version of myself. And that's actually who I created it for. So I wanna create, I wanna take this moment and bring it down to the 20 year old version of Jeff Lerner. What does that person need to hear? And for me, I can, I would say this to that person. It's, I would say, hey, so, you know, 15 or 20 years from now, you're going to have an idea that's going to feel terrifyingly big when you first have it. And every instinct of yours is going to be to try to shrink it to make it feel safer. And your idea is basically going to be that you want to completely disrupt the education industry by creating, you know, a hugely impactful business that essentially couples new economy education and skills with personal development empowerment and progressive thought into one training institution that essentially disrupts the entire educational industry because it teaches more relevant information than college in a more effective way than anything what the fuck did you just say jeff like oh by the way it needs to be like a, a billion dollar company uh, in order, and simply as a way of keeping score, it must be that in order to have had the impact that it should have, right? Like, and you're gonna have, you're gonna make this decision, you're gonna have this realization that that's what the world needs. And hey, well, somebody's gonna do it. Why not me, right? And then you're gonna try to shrink it, and you're gonna try to make it feel safe, and you're gonna reach a point where you realize that if you if you diminish it in any way, you're gonna hate yourself, and so you can't. And then you're gonna have to decide what to do. And it's going to be taking one small step in that direction. And you're going to feel foolish when you do it, right? And for me, it was shooting a video. In September of 2018, I was kind of stressed because I was having this internal wrestling match with myself about maybe I should think smaller. And the world around me seemed to be telling me to think smaller. There was one conversation that I had just been privy to about somebody saying like, oh, Jeff, you and your wife are so extreme. It was about something we, we go to the gym or like something, right? You're, you guys are so extreme, you know, we're not like that or something. Just, you should be less extreme, basically. And for something, something enraged me about that moment so much that I got in my wife's car and started driving all around and I turned my camera on and I went on this rant called Let's Get Ex that I later called Let's Get Extreme. And I realized a couple of weeks later after being terrified to post it because I thought people would make fun of me because all, and all this childhood stuff came up and I used to get bullied and I felt ugly and I felt um, like I, it was all, I was going to have to relive all this pain if I started putting myself out there on the internet. But that was actually the moment that, that Entra was born. 
And that the rest of what, you know, what's probably going to define the rest of my life began was in that one moment. And that it was all a conversation. It was all a, a not a conversation. It was like a brutal knockdown drag out fight with myself between wanting to shrink my own ideas to make them feel safe or challenging myself to maybe grow into the person that could be worthy of the size of the idea. And that that's actually all life ever is. And that frankly, Jeff, better late than never. I'm glad you did it at 39 or when, you know, whatever age I did it. But like, honestly, you could have done it when you were 20. And I would say that to anybody watching this video is like, you've got the capability to have huge ideas and you've got the capability to take steps in the direction of the huge ideas. But you probably also have a whole lot of influences in your life that, that are making that all sound and feel ridiculous. And that the single best thing you could do in your life, and Cameron, I, tell me if you agree with this, is to just create the space between yourself and anything else in your life that sees you as any less than the best potential version of yourself. So that you start to feel at least a little less ridiculous and a little more confident in taking those baby steps in the direction of the huge ideas, rather than feeling like you need to shrink the ideas so that they can be smaller like you are. There's a really good book called, um, uh, oh my God, I'm having a total brain fart on it. Let me pull it up really quick. You know, it's been a long day when. Yeah, totally. Where did it go? Um, I'm on the edge of my seat, so you got to find it. Oh, it's called Atomic Habits. Sorry. I wanted, to, oh, okay. I wanted to say it was The Power of Habit, but I'm like, The Power of Habit's a different book. It's something completely different. I got to get it right. It's called Atomic Habits. Okay. Um, and it's a great, like I do, I genuinely believe first you create your habits, then you create you, but it literally like this, this, the gentleman that wrote this book, it's so powerful because it's just, it really starts to talk about identity level change and identity level change comes from taking actions that start to reinforce themselves in your life. And only way to actually change is to do something. It doesn't have to be like big sweeping changes, like run friggin' 10,000 miles tomorrow. It could be walking to the light post outside your house, but like taking some sort of action towards those goals is the most important thing that like that you can do. And it's, it starts to create these like these, these loops where you start to, it literally starts to change your identity of who you are because you start to believe that I am somebody who, because it's like a lot of times when I mean, we get started, one of the biggest beliefs I had about myself when I first got started, like I used to have long hair and a lip ring. Um, nothing wrong with that. But mm -hmm. when I first, I had this insecurity that nobody would listen to me, even though I had this, I had this knowledge, I was studying for millionaires, I was studying from the greats, I'd accomplished these results that um, nobody would take me seriously because of my age. And it caused this like completely different like compensation. Like it was this insecurity that like nobody would, would do that. And then next thing you know, um, just by going out and, and speaking my truth, um, practicing what I was preaching, doing my thing, honing my craft, taking action before I knew it, it's like I had retired doctors coming to me who had lost everything in the downturn. It was like helping them turn their business around. You know what I mean? Or helping them start a new business from scratch so that they didn't have to go friggin' work at Walmart now. Mm. You know what I mean? It was just like, and like, it was like all of a sudden people that had accomplished what society had put as like this insane ideal. If you could be a heart surgeon and work in that industry for over 40 years, like you've achieved the pinnacle of success by society's terms. Meanwhile, I had individuals like that turning around and coming and hiring me, a 22 year old kid to help them build a business and structure their finances. Hmm. It was like, it was in those moments that it's like, because of practicing and doing it, I had things happen in my life to reinforce the belief. But it's like, you do, you have to remove those things that are taking away from it. It's like, you do, you just, you got to take the first step of what's in front of you. You don't have to see the entire staircase. You got to work with what you've got. You got to be very clear on the decision of what you're willing to accept in your life, what you're willing to stand for, what you're willing to take. And then um, just work with what you've got around you and take your first step. And the crazy thing is that it's different for everybody because everybody wants different things and has different ideals. And then also everybody has different circumstances. They have a different level of education. They have different um, 
energy levels, different time commitments, different mm-hmm. capital they can work. Like it's, everybody's got different circumstances of what they're working in, but it's like everybody can get started with where they are right now. Yeah, so I, I, I remember, it, I, I feel like this Atomic Habits. I remember, so when I decided that I wanted to pivot in this direction towards this entrepreneurial evangelism, and I say I decided, it wasn't so much a decision of this is exactly where I'm going to go. Because it's like you said, sometimes you're aiming at something in the, the technology or the, the clarity or the, the, the staff or the team or whatever. That doesn't, the infrastructure doesn't exist yet. You just, you're just going, right? And I just knew I wanted to go in this direction. And for like months, the only thing I could actually think to do that felt like meaningful action in that direction was just shooting videos. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know how much of them, how much you were aware of it, but like I was just pumping out videos on Facebook and YouTube, well, mo- mostly Facebook. And I, there weren't even that many people watching them. And, it, and half the people that did watch them were, were like mean to me. They would like make fun of me and stuff because I didn't have an audience yet. And it's easy to pick on a guy who seems weak because no one else is watching, right? And so, but it was like, I just knew that I had to, be, I, I was going to go insane if I wasn't taking action and that I had this message and I had to, and, and, for, and for, for months, it was like, all I could do was just make videos. And like, literally it's laughable. If you looked at it, if you, if you go hire like a social media strategist to go back and look at what I was doing, they'd be like, Jeff, you spun your wheels for six months. You didn't gain any traction. You didn't gain any audience. Your content was totally unoptimized. You were putting it all on Facebook, which is the worst platform to try to get organic anything. But it was still for me, that was my atomic habit that I had to have. And then eventually some people started to see what I was doing and maybe one guy heard about it and checked it out. And I got an introduction to someone and they were at least able to go back. They were like, I need to get to know this Jeff guy. Let me go look him up. And they found all these videos and it, at least they got to know what I was about. And they saw that, well, at least he takes massive action. Like he, at least he's not sitting on his ass. And like these things started to coalesce a little bit and pieces came together. And now it's like, it's all happening. But it literally wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had this massive months long spasm of just content creation that at the time seemed almost silly and arbitrary because there was really no method to the madness except for what you're saying. There's progress though. You got moving. Like you can't adjust. I got moving. That's, you can't that's adjust really, anything that's not in motion, right? Thank you. That's exactly. And you nailed it. You're making me realize that was exactly what needed to happen. Because yeah, it was and a lot of people like it was something. Yeah, like the, a lot of times, overwhelm, stress, like it, it's the it, honestly they don't real like a lot of people don't realize it's this feeling of getting stuck, and it doesn't matter what direction you go in. Any motion will help, and you can start to redirect. And I like to use this analogy about marketing, for instance, like we know that there's like very effective ways of targeting your ideal client, like the most like highest priority, effective, efficient ways where you can get 10 times like return on your ad spend. But then there's also like these ineffective things like article marketing today, just general, remember e articles? I used oh, to write yeah. articles. Yeah. That's something I used to do. But to me, I'm like, that's almost like the most ineffective thing, especially if you don't understand SEO, you're not ranking them properly. You're just writing articles for the sake of writing articles. I still genuinely believe that if all I had done was the most ineffective marketing strategy, which was just writing an article a day, if I had done that consistently over the course of these 10 years, I'd be further ahead than I am right now. You'd, you'd be Neil Patel. You know what I mean? Pretty much what he's done. Yeah. With you his, know what I mean? But it's like, it's also like the, it's the most ineffective, but it's still something and it's progress and it's motion. And it's something that you can adjust and that you can fine tune. And a lot of people don't want to start or don't want to do anything because it's like, well, I don't understand. Like I haven't connected all the dots yet. What's the end outcome? What's the light at the end of the tunnel? What's it all for? What's the most effective way? I don't want to waste any time. And it's like, they're not wanting to waste any time to do the most effective thing. It's funny because they're actually wasting time not getting started. Yeah, like they're if he's just doing the most ineffective thing. That's, it's still better. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> you know, ignorance on fire is so much more powerful than than knowledge on simmer. You know, I'll take it any day of the week. And it's just funny yeah. because, like, uh, when I was I was working, I had this one group of clients I was working with over this past year, and most of them were doing around six figures, looking to make that transition to seven. 
And I can remember one of them asked me, he's just like, and he's as close as you could get to the million dollar mark. And he's like, he just asked me, he's like, the only thing I really want to get out of our call today is I really want to understand the shift in mindset from somebody who makes six figures a year to somebody who makes seven figures a year. And I said, oh, that's easy. And it was just funny because it, it genuinely is a mindset. I was like, that's a brilliant question um, because it is, it's true. It's a mindset. And I was like, I, I started to realize how funny it was because all these people that were doing six figures a year, like a lot of people look up to them like, oh my God, they're on this friggin', they're on this pedestal. We can't believe they accomplished this. But you talk to any of them and they're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just taking some action, right. like help me get this thing in direction. And it's like a lot of people don't realize how easy it can be to accomplish and, and achieve something that so many people are putting up on this pedestal as if it's so far out of reach, but it's literally right there for them. And I can remember sitting down with them. I was like, it's very easy. The difference, like the way that somebody typically thinks when they're making, when they're running a business, that's generating six figures, multiple six figures a year is they're thinking very transactional which in a lot of times is very like self-centered. How can I get more? How can I transact? How can I, what can I do here right. now? How can I make a sale? How can I do this? And I'm like, whereas somebody who runs a seven figure or beyond, they don't think transactionally. They think about assets and management. How are they building and growing their assets and how are they managing themselves in relation to those assets? So their time, their capital, the mm. digital assets of how they're growing and managing their company. And it's like, it's a completely different mentality it has nothing to do with it's not transactional at all instead it's more of a place of coming from a place of service mm. instead of like how can i acquire a customer it's like no how can i how can i find somebody to work with that i can work with over the next two and three years i have clients now that i've worked with julian for instance i've been working with julian for over eight years mm. eight years i've been working with julian and he stayed consistent and taken action. He'll be the first person to tell you that he doesn't do much, that he hasn't ever taken full action on all the things that I've told you. And now he runs a business that does over $10 million a year. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And uh, it's just like, it's, it's incredible to see because he was, I mean, Julian's still in his 20s. Julian yeah. was only, he's got to be 28 now. And, but, he was, uh, and he just hired you for coaching, right? Yeah, he hired me for, for coaching at the time, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, Cam, listen, man, I, uh, if, uh, unfortunately, like it, it devastates me to do this. I actually have to go. I have to wrap this up. <laughs> I do. I've I, lost complete track of time. Yeah, now I know it. It's now Friday I know evening it, uh, he, and I have, my family's like, where's Jeff? Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, yeah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this for us for now, but be assured there. Yeah. I look forward to much more. And, and, and I'm glad you said how much you're enjoying this format because it's, newer to me this is like the fifth or sixth conversation like this i've had this mine end up have, having been the longest but like <laughs> i i just love it and i just feel like there's so much energy and growth that I, like th this is the most selfish thing i'm doing in my life this is like I, I get so much out of this and i gotta think you know one of the reasons joe rogan's such a cool interesting guy is because joe rogan just like has awesome conversations with awesome people all the time all day. And that's you the only know. thing like, the, like I, I've been talking about starting a podcast for years. I've never done it. But the only thing that I think could make this better would be like Joe Rogan's format where it's in person, because then we, you literally, you can lose track of the camera. You can lose track of the audio and we can just have an awesome conversation. It's the thing I love watching about his is like, you genuinely feel like you're hanging out with them. Yeah. Um, totally. And it's just where the best conversations come from. And like, yeah, I, I do. I, I genuinely love this format because I feel like the longer you talk, the longer you get into it, the more all of the other nonsense falls away. You can get lost in the conversation because so much in our space, especially doing a lot of teaching, training, coaching, consulting, and educating is talking at somebody versus here. We get to talk with each other and to mm -hmm. somebody, which is completely different. Yeah, super cool. No, it really is. And I'm, I appreciate you participating in it and supporting it. And I, I look forward to doing it again. And I hope I'll get to be a guest on, on yours when that happens. Yeah, sooner or later, it'll, it'll happen. One day. One day. Well, One cool, day. Man. I do, cool, uh, I'm happy to come on anytime. Just let me know. I, I, I definitely love spending time and, uh, and having these kinds of in-depth conversations. I totally will. So I don't know if you have anything prepared or even want to bother with it, but if, if, is there a call to action or something you can invite people to do to 
track you more, learn more from you, maybe get involved in one of your programs? Like what's, what is Cam pushing these days, if anything? Uh, honestly, just hit me on Facebook. Um, I, I'm like the one person who doesn't have anything anywhere. Um, <laughs> I had, I, I'm thinking about putting my site and stuff back up. I just, I don't know. I, I kind of, I relish in the fact that I get to operate at this level behind the scenes and that most people don't know who I am. It's, it's kind of, it's pretty cool. It's kind of satisfying actually. Um, feel free to hit me up on Facebook. It's Cameron with a K K A M E R O N George. Um, there will be a website and stuff coming up soon, but no, I don't really have a call to action for now. I mean, I'm sure they'll, they'll eventually one day see something that either we're working on or that I've put out there. Um, and, uh, if people want more information or to see what I'm up to or some of the projects and things that I'm working on, just go ahead to, and, and either hit up my page on Facebook or my personal Facebook. And I'm sure that that will be the, the best place for contact. I'm a little quiet, but when I do peep out, there's usually something yeah. important. <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, I, I'll say as, as someone who's, who's privileged to get to be your friend, man, like truly the, the behind the scenes engineering you know, I don't want to call you the wizard behind the curtain because as it turned out, the wizard was, I think, actually a fraud <laughs> in, the, in the story. But like, no, I mean, that, that, there, there are those guys. But it, to me, it all speaks to the same truth that's really so much part of my message, which is that if you'll just you know, commit and decide to learning these skills, it starts with skills. Do what Cameron did. What, what money you have, spend it on courses, spend it on knowledge acquisition, the time, the energy. And frankly, it is important to invest money. And I think, I mean, even though this is a free video on YouTube, there's actually only so much you'll get out of free videos on YouTube because at the end of the day, your heart does kind of follow your money and you're less inclined to take action on stuff that you learn for free. Oh, you, you won't know? take it as seriously. You don't. I, I actually, I, I did a test with this. I did, I gave, so I had a, a very, I had a coaching sequence that people used to pay me forty to fifty thousand dollars to be able to to go through, and I took a lot of the heart of that content and I put it out for free. Crickets. Um, a yeah. lot of times, people only take they take things seriously and they make a larger commitment when there's things tied to it. And you literally, there's a direct correlation to outcome and results to the amount that somebody has invested and the seriousness and the level of commitment that they've made in correlation to it. And it's just, it's super fascinating to see, but it also, it makes sense. It's like, it's Hey, I freaking I hired this person for this much money. Like, let, let's go. Right, right. Not like, I'll get around to that when I get a chance. Like, it doesn't matter. And my, I, yeah, it's no, I know that's true. I mean, that's people like Jeff, why do you, if you know all this and you don't need the money, why do you, why do you charge for it? Because you'll, you won't value it or take it seriously. Yeah, and, well, and also because as a good entrepreneur, I actually believe the profit motive is an inherently really positive force in our world. And I would not want to do shit for free. But Any business that is not profitable is not sustainable. And anybody who would understand commerce and economics would very be very wise to want any business product or thing that they value to ensure that they have healthy profit margins so that it can be sustainable. Yeah, exactly. So my point being simply, you know, follow, follow Cameron's example here because Cameron's a great example of a guy that's like, Cam, you don't, you're not, you know, you're not a big influencer. You're not famous. You're not a celebrity, but, but you're absolutely killing him. You make more money in a month than most people do in a year, or in some cases, a decade doing all this behind the scenes stuff that nobody even knows, but it's the same stuff. It's built on the same skills. It's all the same it, principles. It's the same it skills commit to the skills and set yourself free and find whatever, whatever that looks like for you. What, what it looks like for Cameron is very different than what it looks like for me, but yet it's, it's built on the same stuff. And that's the beauty of this, right? Is it doesn't just have to look one way. Um, anyway. So, Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for your time. I'm going to go uh, see my wife and kids. And I'm going to go play with my daughter too, before bedtime here. So you have a great Beautiful. evening, dude. This was a pleasure. And I look forward to doing it again sometime. Yeah. Likewise, man. Take care. Have a great night. Take care.